change we the light ready. bulbs. Ready to roll. Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, October 18, 2018 regular meeting of the school committee. We have just returned from executive session and at this point I would ask everyone in the audience to please rise so we can send a pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so just looking through the agenda quickly, we have an opportunity for uh, recognitions, if people have recognitions tonight, and then public comments. We have a number of reports to the school committee. We have a uh, club stipend positions that are being shifted from one to another uh, that I believe Mr. Bishop is not going to be here. Are you giving that? Correct. And yes. then uh, budget transfer requests, like our 10-year capital plan, and then we have a school community resource bridge subcommittee proposal a turf field subcommittee uh, update, Hopkins School gift account, a couple of policies that are uh, new, and then we will return for some second reading policies, go into future agenda items, a second opportunity for public comments, and then we will go to items by consensus before we uh, adjourn for the evening. So at this point, I would ask, oh, thank you. I would ask if there are any recognitions here that are not, have not been um, pulled out. Anybody have anything they want to recognize? I, I was hoping to mention Mrs. Martell. Um, Mrs. Martell was a librarian at Elmwood School, and we lost her um, earlier this week. And uh, I think all the kids loved her. That's what I've heard from my son and other kids. I think librarians play a very important role in anybody's life. Um, and I have interacted with Mrs. Martell over over the past couple of years, and she was a very stoic person. Uh, I loved her smile. I think she'll be deeply missed. So I just wanted to call that out. Thank you. In, indeed, she will be deeply missed. Uh, it, was, it was a loss to the Elmwood community and to our entire community. So thank you for calling that out. So at this point, uh, we have our first opportunity for public comment. I don't know if anybody is here for public comment. You can come up um, if you would like. Is there anything we can do about that delightful background music? I am not sure that there is. Okay. Great. Oh, great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So, welcome and thank you for coming. Um, if you could just thank you. Is this on? Uh, it should be Mike. Should be on. And then, right. uh, if you could just introduce yourself, and then sure. we would love to hear. From you. All right. I'm Sudesh Nair. Uh, that's my wife, Minnie. We are uh, long-term residents of this uh, community in Hopkinton. Uh, we moved in here in 2003. Uh, have, we have two kids in the Hopkinton Public Schools. I'm very proud of them. <laughs> so what, the reason I'm here is uh, to bring to the attention of the school committee that a problem that we have um, in the middle school, with the middle school kids, the new kids on the sixth grade, uh, we are already uh, you know, nine weeks into the school, around 30 kids are asked to move into a different team, new classmates, all new teachers. teachers. Um, these, these are new entrants to the middle school, so they're, they're just there, they're getting used to their teachers, making friends, um, and getting settled, very comfortable, and now we're asking them, okay, now we're gonna to move to this new team. And one of the affected kids is my daughter. So, see the thing is, I'm not questioning the decision to hire teachers. I know the school committee made a right decision to hire new teachers, but the process of selecting these kids and moving them into this new team, there was no transparency. And the kids are literally crying the first day that she came and cried. <laughs> it, it was very, very painful. See, I'm a very introvert person. It takes a lot to get me here in front of the camera and the mic. It hurts me. So I think that the process was not right. And my daughter was telling me <clears throat> there were kids who wanted to move. They were not given an option to opt in. They were said, okay, you guys are moving. 
So again, the school committee, I know you don't interfere in the administration of the school, but when you make a decision to hire new teachers, you know there is going to be an impact. You can always guide the school to make sure that the people affected are involved in the decision-making process and they get a voice, right? So the kids, they have a voice. My daughter wrote to the school committee. So, um, and they, you know, their, her friends wrote to the principal. But I don't know whether there, anything will come out of it. So I'm, I'm here to appeal to the school committee to take some action on this and uh, you know, work with the school to make this much more um, amenable so that maybe there's an opt-in option that you can give them. I, I'm, not, I'm not recommending any solutions here, but I'm just saying that there, 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 there are better ways to do it. So again, what is the message that we are giving these kids, right? So there's a public school system, it has to be fair to all the kids. And you know, I think the message here right now is that you don't have a voice. We decide for you, and do it. You do it. That that that's that's all I had. For today. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. I I will say that this is the hard thing in public comment because of our open meeting law that we have to comply with. We don't have the ability to answer back. But I we did receive the letter uh, from your daughter, which was very eloquently written. Um, and. I have to say it's the first time we have had a student at that age reach out to us like that, and I think that does make an impact uh, to hear from a student directly. Thank, I, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if there are no other public comments for our public comment period, I would invite our, uh, our school, student council to come up and give a report for the student council. If you guys just want to introduce yourself again, that would be great for the our audience at home. Uh, I'm Steve Mafiori, and I'm a junior. And I'm William Dion, and I'm also a junior. Um, so we don't have too much here for you guys today. Just a quick little recap of what's been going on lately. Uh, recently, there was a regional student council meeting. Um, so there's four people in our school. Uh, I'm a member myself, and we go to Hudson for a day, and we meet with um, a couple of other representatives from each school and their student council, and we share ideas, and we bring feedback back, and we talk to Mr. Bishop about it. And uh, at the meeting, we're put in different groups, so um, each of us are going to have a task that we want to improve in the school systems, and we're going to uh, it's kind of have a little project through it, throughout the year, and we're going to try to come up with a different plan or we'll present with the school board, of uh, Massachusetts school, school board, and we're going to try to see if, if we can make different improvements, and then we're going to bring those back to the school, so that's always awesome. Um, next Thursday, October 25th, is the international night, uh, so all our international students and foreign exchange students come. We have a big table. Uh, they can they share their experiences so far, how everything's going, what's different. Um, and they're open to questions about where they come from. So oftentimes they talk about like the difference between the food here and there and in their schools. So that's always great to learn how they're adjusting to uh, Hockenden High. Um, turf field opened this week. Uh, the field hockey team had their first had the first official game on it. So that was that went well. It's always good to have it open. Um, it's been a little struggle to figure out who which teams get it, but it's going great so far. Um, last Friday was pep rally, uh, so that's always fun. Um, it was a good, great pep rally this year. It was a, a lot of attendance, not too many people skipped out on it, which is awesome. Uh, the football team won that night, so yeah, it was always fun. Um, and today, during Unite, we had a pumpkin carving contest. Uh, we didn't actually uh, carve the pumpkins, but we decorated them all. So we had a competition between the Unite groups to see who could uh, be the most creative and um, uh, uh, like decorate the pumpkins. So that was awesome. My group made an apple, so <laughs> very creative. <laughs> yeah. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, upcoming on the twenty fourth and the twenty fifth of October, 
um, the NEASC um, will be coming, um, and there um, a couple of visitors will be uh, meeting and speaking with um, uh, teachers, parents, and students, um, and observing the classrooms um, in our school. Additionally, um, I believe next Friday, uh, the 26th, will be a Hiller Day. Um, and I know I've been liking those again this year. That's um, a very positive thing, I believe, that our school has been doing. Um, additionally, tomorrow is an early release. Um, a lot of people are happy about that. I know I am. Um, and again, tomorrow night, um, there will be a Be Free concert um, at 7, or 7 p.m. at the high school. Um, and that's Be Free is a club, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, who promote, uh, or promote um, substance-free events. Um, so it's a fun time um, to go out with your friends and um, members of the school um, who play instruments or, or sing um, or do different things. Um, they, they show up with their instruments and it's a really fun time. Um, additionally, Senior Halloween will be coming up. Um, that's always a fun experience for the school. Um, all the seniors get to um, dress up and it's a really cool uh, tradition, especially for the seniors. And then um, finally, a really special thing for our school is that um, Next Wednesday, the 24th, will be the first home unified basketball game. Um, and again, our school has been really um, excited about the unified program. Um, and we're really excited um, to be able to have this, this first game. And we're hoping to get a high attendance from um, the school. Anything else? That's all we got today. That's all we got. Thank you very much. Hey, for thank time. you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Always a highlight to see you guys. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so that brings us up to the next report. We have the founder of the HDCA, Tamoria Seba, who is going to come up and uh, do a report on the HDCA. So, and there were some agenda materials in the packet uh, related to the HDCA for people who are following along at home. In the event that people don't read our packet. Well, I tried. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Hello. Good Hi. evening. How are you? I'm just going to get my paperwork organized. It's really some of the stuff that I sent you. So um, as I'm speaking, I will probably just guide you as to where to look as I'm talking. Looking at all your faces is kind of a trip down memory lane over the last three years I've lived here. Amanda, we served together on Youth Commission. Meg, I couldn't remember how we met. I just feel like you've always been there around. Just lurking. Yeah. <laughs> but we've had some really great moments. Mina, we met waiting in line to, uh, to get balloons for our kids in the common. common. Probably waited an hour. It was horrible, but we made it through together. Hopefully they were and good balloons. And then we met up for a coffee at Bittersweet. After that, and the rest is history, Nancy served on Girl Scouts as co-leaders together. So um, it's really nice to see your faces. And um, you know, I just want to start off by saying thank you to all of you, school committee, Dr. Kavanaugh, for taking the time to meet with me tonight. I know that your schedule is really busy. Um, the Hopkinton Diversity and Cultural Alliance, as you know, I founded in 2016, will be referred to for the rest of this conversation as the HDCA, just because it's long to say Hopkinton Diversity and Cultural Alliance every time that I'm going to need to say it. So I'll, the first thing I want to do at the beginning of the conversation is just, I think it's super important to start off by noting that all of my prior interactions between myself and the former superintendent, Dr. McLeod, and the current superintendent, Dr. Kavanaugh, have been positive, not contentious, like some might assume, based on things they've seen on social media, or maybe heard through the infamous Hopkinton grapevine. No names mentioned. I am a Hopkinton resident. I live at 47 School Street with my husband and two daughters. As I've said before, I'm the founder of the HDCA, I'm the chair of the Youth Commission, and I work as a maternal health advocate with a focus on birth trauma and postpartum mood disorders. I'm here today because the HDCA has been brought up many times in your public meetings, and there's been conflict and confusion that has arisen in the community about our relationship with the school committee, Dr. McLeod, Dr. Kavanaugh, and the school administration. So I hope tonight that I can shed light on the work we've done and clear up any confusion about our group and answer any questions that you might have. So as I said before, my family moved to Hopkinton in December of 2015. When I moved here, I took my time getting to know all the different types of residents. 
Before we purchased our home, we rented at Legacy Farms, the source of much debate here in town. I would ask older residents what their lives were like here, growing up, seeing Hopkinton when it was just a small town. They were very open and honest with me about how the changes in demographics were scaring them. By demographics, I'm referring to race and socioeconomics. I met new residents who seemed disconnected from the concerns of longtime residents. I met parents who were worried about their children. I met families who wondered how they would survive in a town that was transitioning so fast from a small working class town to an affluent town where taxes keep going up and many are struggling to survive. These are the people we often don't see or hear about in our daily lives. So many people don't look beyond what's in front of them. Hopkinton is a beautiful town with great schools and great people. But within Hopkinton, as in all places, are some not so great aspects and some not so great people. Many don't see what we like to call the others. Who are the others? In Hopkinton, some of these other people are poor people. 4% of Hopkintonians are living at or below poverty level. And just for reference, in case anyone doesn't know, the government guidelines set the poverty level at $27,000 per year. So let's face it, many people here are actually struggling, even making six figures. No one sees them or hears about their struggles. Some people just don't care. The increase in racial diversity has also created tension with over 12% of the population now consisting of South Asians, there's a real culture shock happening here on both sides. A mostly white town adjusting to seeing more brown faces and these new residents experiencing racial discrimination probably for the first time because perhaps they didn't experience it in their birth countries. So many people feel invisible, especially the African-American children who only make up 0.8% of our school population. Then there is the LGBTQ community. Kids who are not only struggling with coming to terms with who they are, but often being bullied, mocked, and ridiculed for it. The special needs community, also a group who often feels left out. Parents of children who are different learners often struggle to find support and allies from the parents of mainstream learners. Like their parents, children with special needs are often marginalized from their peers and the community. In the year prior to founding the HDCA, all of these issues were constantly brought to my attention. My work as a maternal health advocate requires to me impartial, objective, and meet the needs of my clients no matter their race, age, income, religion, sexual orientation, etc. And anyone who knows me knows that I love my job. It wasn't my first career choice. A lot of people you all know, I was a celebrity makeup artist for many years until my oldest daughter was born and I suffered a near fatal postpartum hemorrhage. When I discovered how little resources there were for women who had experienced similar birth traumas, that's when I decided to become a full-time maternal health advocate. I found at the HDCA for similar reasons. The desire to provide support and resources where few existed. The difference was the type of resources. I remember spending several days crafting that initial HDCA mission statement, which reads as follows. Communication, inclusion, respect. These are the essential aspects of living in a community in which people who live together interact, form friendships, and participate fully in the community's economic, political, civic, and cultural life. The seeds of true acceptance, understanding, and most importantly, appreciation of the diversity that makes up our local community are planted when we are young. As parents who have chosen to live in Hopkinton, we understand this. 
as well as the fact that when we as adults get to know our neighbors, it helps to reinforce the ideals we hope to instill in our children. We hope you'll join us, exclamation point. <laughs> so what was the purpose of the group? To foster cultural connections with families, explore diversity through crafts, play, stories, food, and music, participate in parent conversations about social justice issues, as well as differences in culture, race, religion, sexual orientation, socioeconomics, age, and abilities. Host events that represent and celebrate the diversity of our community. I had no idea at the time that we would evolve beyond a Facebook group. I was just focused on meeting the immediate need of providing a space for people to vent, share stories, find, and give support. As we evolved past a Facebook group and sought to be active in the community, I was clear that we must focus on all the needs all the time. We had to be conscious of every issue and not solely focus on issues that only affected us as individuals. We must care about our friends, our neighbors, and their children. Their issues are our issues. We are one. We must build relationships of mutual respect with the town officials, police, fire department, and most importantly for us in our work, the schools. I'm a believer that in order to get what you want, just start at the top, cut out all the middlemen. If the top person says no, then you don't want to bother with the rest, right? So in December of 2016, I emailed Dr. McLeod, our former superintendent, to tell her about the group that I'd formed, the HDCA, and our goals. I let her know about some of the difficult things that residents were struggling with that had been brought to our attention. These things included a kindergartner of Indian descent who had been on the receiving end of negative comments about her skin from her white classmates, a member of the LGBTQ community who had endured bullying and harassment, and a mother who was struggling to pay fees for school supplies. We had a great meeting, and she wrote me an email later that day to express her excitement about working together on diversity and inclusions in Hopkinton, issues in Hopkinton. The next meeting, and most meetings after that, also included Denise Hildreth, Director of Youth and Family Services. Denise is a person every resident should know about. Denise is a licensed clinical social worker with a PhD. Her knowledge, passion, and dedication to helping others in our community is outstanding. It's important to note that Denise is a town employee, not a school employee, but she often works with the schools on initiatives. And her services are free to all residents. Dr. McLeod, Denise, and, I, and myself decided that in order to bring the issues to the forefront, it was necessary to host a community forum. Dr. McLeod said, and this is her quote, you know we have to blow this thing up, T. It has to all come out. I said, I know, it does. Denise and Dr. McLeod expressed concern for me that I might be on the receiving end of vitriol from members of the community. I reassured them that I was used to it due to the public nature of my profession, which often involves challenging politicians and discussing uncomfortable issues that no one wants to talk about. I felt that I was more than prepared for whatever may come. We held a small gathering in the school library. Around 20 people attended. They were from all walks of life. Some of you here were there that first meeting. That's why I said it's an interesting trip down memory lane. Men, women, whites, blacks, Indian, Middle Eastern, gay, straight, different religions, everyone was there. As each person went around the room to express their concerns, the one thing that was consistent amongst every person was the feeling of not being connected to other people. Lack of support and fear about speaking up about diversity and inclusion issues of all types. We then held a larger community forum on March 3rd, 2017. The speakers included Asha Sharing, a mother of two and an optometrist, Natalie Langlois, a lawyer and mother of three, 
Marla Marasco, mother of 12-year-old Jacob and also known as a nationally known uh, Down syndrome advocate, Meg Tyler, before her role on the school committee, an esteemed professor and mother to cute Otto, <laughs> Amon Hedry, and selectman John Coutino. At the end of that forum, a young woman in the crowd felt compelled to stand up and share her story. Abby, who at the time was a high school senior about to graduate, told the crowd how she was Jewish and bisexual, and her family had moved to Hopkinton from Needham in seventh grade. She shared her experience in the schools of being made fun of for being Jewish, criticism for her bat mitzvah celebration, and also her struggle to fit into what she referred to as the Hopkinton perfect box, which many teens have come to me personally and described as white, popular, and rich. After this particular forum, I decided that the HDCA needed to take a more active role in the schools. And so I went to Dr. McLeod and I asked her for her support to create the HDCA Parent Advisory Group, intended to be a focus group of parents representing different segments of our population so that we could assist in any diversity issues. She was supportive, and I personally vetted each individual to make sure they were fully invested in this initiative. The HDC advisory group consisted of, and you have the packet in front of you, if you wanna, I don't know if you guys have looked at it, but you can see the advisory group is here. And then there are bios, and then a few more were added in. And as you can see, they all represent a wonderful cross-section that reflects the school population. On June 18th of 2017, Dr. McLeod met with the HDCA Parent Advisory Group at my home. Nancy and Meg were present, again, as residents, <laughs> not as school committee members. The school committee were, were you present as, okay, I just want to make sure. Both. Okay, Both. all right. Dr. McLeod felt that the group had great representation, and she felt that it was a good time to start meeting with high school principal Evan Bishop and middle school principal Alan Keller. I began meeting with both principals during the summer of 2017, and we set very clear goals for how the HDCA would be able to help teachers, students, and parents tackle diversity and inclusion issues. As most of us know, on September 2nd of 2017, there was an incident on the high school track involving a young African American woman and three white teenage males. Here is what was shared publicly about the incident. If you happen to have a son who enjoys riding his bicycle with his two male friends on the Hopkinton High School track and was there this evening, Saturday, around 6.30 to 6.45ish, then there is something you should be made aware of. The three boys were dumping the trash out of the trash cans and they were hanging on poles, acting like monkeys and calling my 21-year-old daughter a monkey nigger. My daughter was attempting to do a final workout before heading back to college. This high school track has been her home away from home for many years. And at all hours, she has felt safe being there training. This evening, she felt unsafe. Thankfully, an adult male stepped up and yelled at the trio and then checked in with my daughter. My husband also went over to the track and I called the police. And now I want to share a few stories with you. This is from another African-American female who graduated from Hopkinton High School a couple years ago. My sister is a freshman in high school. It's supposed to be filled with memories and friendships and endless laughs. I'm truly saddened to hear about this incident on the track. I went through the same thing in high school with a guy telling me and my best friend he was going to lynch me and my family. He told me I meant nothing because of my skin, and the school did nothing about it. I'm also saddened because this is happening to me in college. These huge life events for both of us are being ruined by true ignorance, and I wish the schools would do something about it. You can't just sit there and wait for it to stop because all you care about is your quote unquote reputation and quote unquote values and in capital letters, do something. Our regular babysitter 
she gave me permission to use her name, Shakima Card. She graduated Hopkinton High School four years ago. Shakima was one of two blacks, both girls, in her graduating class, pretty much from elementary school all the way up through 12th grade. In elementary school, an art teacher gave the students a project to create a self-portrait. All the students were given pieces of construction paper similar to their skin tones. The teacher handed Shakima a black piece of paper. When Shakima asked the teacher why she was given a black piece of paper, the teacher replied, because you're black, that's your skin color. Obviously, Shakima should have been given a brown piece of paper, or maybe even choose the color she felt represented her the best on that particular day. All of the students and the teacher then laughed at her. In middle school, a teacher lost her pen. She singled out Shakima in front of the class and asked, did you take my pen? Shakima replied, no. Why do you think I took it? The teacher replied, your people like to steal things. Again, laughter from the class while this young student was left embarrassed and humiliated. Shakima felt afraid to tell her mother about it as her parents are both immigrants. She struggled as an American student, African American, to try to navigate these things. It's only been recently that she's begun to share the stories of what her life was like having moved from a diverse population that they used to live in in Roslindale to Hopkinton, but her parents brought her here for a better life, a better education. There were several more incidents like this during her school years. Shakima was called a nigger out loud during class by another student. The teacher failed to take action and sent Shakima to the principal's office. When the student was reprimanded, the student who called Shakima a nigger, was reprimanded by the principal, the student told Shakima that he would make her life hell. And he did. Every chance he got, every single day, he sat behind her or near her in class and taunted and tormented her with racial comments. Any chance he got. Even through all of this, Shakima graduated with a 3.9 GPA. She won several scholarships and awards, but didn't attend the high school awards ceremony because, and I quote, Tamoria, those people didn't care about me. Why would I bother going to receive my awards in front of them? During our three years of living here, our eight-year-old daughter, has experienced negative comments and behavior from students. She's currently in third grade, and I won't share all of the details here, but this past spring, a student in her class said, black people suck, and there's a word for them that begins with N. It is at this age that we must take action to educate our children on what language is appropriate and what isn't acceptable. What happened to Shakima and several other students happened and continues to happen because the schools aren't being proactive in correcting this behavior and language at five, six, seven, eight, and nine years old. It is uncomfortable to tackle these issues. And that's where we felt like we could really help. The HDCA sought to be a partner to the schools. As we work with Dr. McLeod and the school administration, it was our belief that our role had been solidified, and we created plans for our starting HDCA chapters in the middle and high schools. As we did our work in the schools, I received disparaging text, emails, and confrontations from employees of Hopkinton schools. These included criticism about Martin Luther King Jr. Day. I was actually sent a text that said, what does it have to do with him being black? Because at the time I had um, hired an African-American storyteller. We also had a student of Indian descent as our speaker. It was the first time in the history of MLK Day in Hopkinton that a person of color was the guest speaker. I also received criticism about the HDCA student groups in the schools. Two school employees expressed that they were uncomfortable having to discuss why people are different. They said they only wanted to talk about ways that we are all alike 
and plan fun cultural events centered around food and dancing because that's more fun. I run support groups. And for those of you who are familiar with support groups, you know that the groups are really led by the attendees, the group members. When we formed the HDCA chapters in the middle and high school, I made it clear to the students that it was their group. We were just here to make their wishes come true and give them a platform that they were so desperately seeking. All events and programs would come from their ideas. Let me be clear. We are not going to find solutions for racism, poverty, or any of the other diversity and inclusion issues by singing, eating, and dancing our way through it all. Our kids are being raised in the 21st century. This requires us to face these issues head on, always in an age-appropriate manner, but if we want to do it successfully, head on. With my background in sales, education, and training, along with being a public health advocate, I felt that I could take all of this on pretty easily. I also attended grade school with mostly white people and have a white family, so I've had a lifetime of navigating diversity and inclusion issues. However, I'm not an expert, but I'm an African-American mother of two biracial children. We chose to live in Hopkinton because it seemed like a family-friendly town. It has natural beauty and, of course, great schools. It never really crossed our minds that because most of the population is white, our children would be subjected to negative racial comments, but I guess that was our naivety. During the past two years, I shared numerous resources with Dr. McLeod and, McLeod and school administrators. In the fall of 2017, after what was probably at that point 30 plus meetings with myself, Dr. McLeod, HDCA members Don Ronan, Natalie Lang Law, and a few others, including the principals of the, some of the schools, Dr. McLeod formed a group known as the Community Communications Committee. Based on conversations she'd had with Mina Barrett, I think this was before you became a school committee member, I'm not sure. Just after. Okay. This committee brought together the heads of various committees that were involved in the schools. The group included Mina, Marla Marasco, then head of CPAC, the former president of the HPTA, Denise Hildreth, and Dr. McLeod. It was our understanding, the HDCA's understanding, that this group would be proactive in diversity and inclusion initiatives. However, as time went on, our voices were muted and the priorities of the other group members took over. The Community Communications Committee eventually evolved into something we didn't recognize. It became the Community Calendar Committee. It was disheartening to say the least. Natalie, Don, and I struggled to understand why after all the events and positive impact we were having in the community, why we weren't farther along in our goals. However, we continued to persevere and we moved forward. One day, Dr. McLeod reached out to me to ask, out of all the resources I had provided, which organization did I feel would be best to help us really start working on implementing programs, trainings, et cetera, on diversity and inclusion in Hopkinton. I told her that I'd heard wonderful things about Visions, Inc. They're very fair and balanced. They assess an entire community before rushing in and saying, do this or do that. Dr. McLeod scheduled a meeting with the director of Visions, Rick Penderhughes, on September 29th, 2017. This meeting included myself, Don Ronan, Natalie Langlaw, Dr. McLeod, town manager Norman Kamalo, Brian Herr, not in his role as selectman, but as a resident, the former HPTA president, HPTA health and wellness coordinators, an HPTA programming coordinator, middle school principal Alan Keller, high school principal Evan Bishop, former CPAC president Marla Marasco, Youth and Family Services Director Denise Hildreth, Mina Barreth, and Jean Birchman, former school committee chair. Are you there? No. Okay. Okay. Mr. Mr. Penderhughes' presentation was well received, and he was impressed by the work the HDCA had already done. When he suggested doing a survey, 
Dr. McLeod told him that she would like to forego that option because the HDCA had already done a community assessment in several forums. Mr. Prendehue said that the HDCA parent advisors were a perfect fit for the Visions Train the Trainer program. We had enough information to go on based on our work and we were ready to proceed with action. Logistics for implementation and budget for the programs were then discussed. Dr. McLeod, Mr. Kumalo, and Mr. Herr suggested to Jean Birchman, former chair of the school committee, that the school committee try to find money in a way to implement our programs. Ms. Birchman told the group that she would relay the information back to the school committee as a board and that we would set up a meeting to discuss in the future. This never happened. Ms. Birchman received all of the HDCA documentation that you all have, including the community narratives and the HDCA parent bios on October 5th, 2017. I was copied on an email to her from Ms. Barrett as a follow-up to the meeting, to which Jean Birchman replied, thank you for sharing. We heard nothing from her since that moment in regards to visions or any other diversity and inclusion programming. As I've stated before, the HDCA is always thinking about all the needs all the time. It was during all of this that we had another opportunity come up. This was an opportunity to have former Red Sox player John Troutwain speak about suicides. Mr. Troutwain's son committed suicide at the age of 15. And now Mr. Troutwain has become a highly sought after speaker throughout schools all across America. Dr. McLeod turned down the opportunity, stating that the cost was prohibitive because she wanted to allocate budget dollars towards diversity and inclusion issues. Along with Denise Hildreth, I voiced my strong support for this suicide program with Mr. Troutwine. Many students in Hopkinton reached out to us seeking help for understanding how to discuss suicides and mental health issues I failed to comprehend why there had to be a choice when it comes to mental health and diversity and inclusion. Can't we see how all these things are intertwined? We must find ways to seize all the opportunities that are presented before us. December of 2017 would be one of the last few times I would see Dr. McLeod for a while. She had received the proposal from Visions and asked me to meet with the H other HDCA members, Don Ronan and Natalie Langlois, to review it. Present at the meeting were also members of the community calendar committee that I mentioned earlier. The estimate for visions ranged from approximately $3,500 to $22,000, depending on what services we chose to use from them. During this meeting, Dr. McLeod's whole energy changed on her opinion of visions. She simply stated that she didn't like that the proposal took too long, in her opinion, to receive. And then she mentioned that we didn't have the budget. And as you can see from the other things that I've told you, it was our understanding all of this time that dollars were constantly, constantly being allocated for diversity and inclusion based on prior meetings, phone calls, and emails. We were disappointed. We had worked very hard to research organizations to best assist all Hopkinton residents. We're never focused on just one group. Other groups like the ADL or SPLC can often be seen as too polarizing, especially in communities like ours. If we're going to tackle these issues, we first have to be honest about who we are as a community, all of us. The HDCA are boots on the ground. We have a clear understanding of what works and what doesn't. I think there's a misconception that we don't include others. This isn't true. The reality is that diversity and inclusion are today's buzzwords. Many people think that they want to be a part of their work, but then once the hard work actually begins, people are too uncomfortable to continue. We had done the hard work. We had done the research. We conducted an assessment. The community trusts us. We expected the school administration to do the same. 
I knew that Dr. McLeod was taking medical leave, and so we dropped discussing, discussing visions for a while. But the HDCA continued to work in the schools and community at large. The last time I saw Dr. McLeod was maybe around January before she took her full leave. She introduced us to Dr. Kavanaugh, and we discussed the HDC in our work. And in her words, in that meeting, she said, Dr. Kavanaugh, the HDCA has carte blanche to be in the schools. They've earned it. They have the trust of the community. They have the trust of the teachers. They have the trust of the students. And they know what they're doing. Some of the work that we are most proud of, if you want to refer to your sheets entitled HDCA Events 2016, some of the work we're most proud of are the three workshops we hosted for teachers in the spring. And one student workshop. We were invited by Principal Bishop to present a workshop at what's called Ed Camp. It's a day for middle and high school teachers to take workshops about various subjects. Our workshops were met with great enthusiasm and we received tons of positive feedback. Present at these workshops were myself, Natalie Langlaw, Don Ronan, and Lynn Canty, another HDCA parent advisor. While we were at school that day during our first workshop, the word spread through the building like wildfire. And by the time of our second presentation, we had almost tripled the size of the first. The administration is craving help with diversity and inclusion issues in, the, in our schools. They felt comfortable with us. They felt comfortable with me. And some reached out for assistance after that. Please take note of the February workshop for seventh graders titled The Adventures of Tom Sawyer exploring race, language, and civil rights during the Reconstruction era and beyond. HDCA members present at this workshop included Natalie Langlaw, Sonia Fairbanks, Lynn Canty, Meg Tyler, again as a resident, not as school committee member yet. This workshop was created, I created a 60-page PowerPoint presentation, which I sent to Dr. Kavanaugh for review. After discussing it, I condensed it to 20, we felt that the seventh graders probably couldn't survive two hours. <laughs> I like to talk. <laughs> but I condensed it to 20 pages, and it was an hour long, and it went off great. Dr. Kavanaugh wrote me with praise afterwards. And Dr. Kavanaugh, you are a highly respected professional in education. After all these conversations and some of the distance that has occurred between you and the HDCA, I would have expected that based on some of the things that we've exchanged privately, that if you had any object objectives to, about what the HDCA was doing, that you would just call me, email me, or set up a meeting one-on-one -on -one to discuss. Instead, little by little, what's happened is that the HDCA has been shut out from diversity and inclusion work in the schools. When my husband and I met with Dr. Kavanaugh this past June, I asked you to tell me what had changed. Why weren't we hearing from the administration like we had been in the past? You first said, this is going to sound mean, to which I replied, that's OK. I talk to politicians all the time, and they tell me very mean things. You stated that I make the teachers uncomfortable, then quickly changed the statement to, not just you, all parents. The teachers don't like working with parents. It makes them uncomfortable to work with parents. Well, this is very surprising because I've been a volunteer in the school since my daughter has been in kindergarten here. The HPTA, CPAC, and HEF are welcomed by teachers and staff. So what's so different with us? Well, what I represent is uncomfortable for everyone, I guess. I'm black. People are afraid to talk about race here. That's no secret. I represent the voice of people of color, the HDCA speaks up for the poor, the disabled, mentally ill, the LGBTQ community, and countless others who are representatives of things that make other people uncomfortable. However, the HDCA, and in particular myself, were willing to walk hand in hand with all of you to help build bridges, increase education, 
and foster courageous conversations. I would find it so hard to believe that after everything I've expressed here so far, that you still don't understand why the HDCA was upset at not being included in current diversity work and the development of the survey. We are the data. There are 500 members in our group. And it was great that you received over 500 responses. I'm, I'm happy about that. But we've already done so much of the work that you are stating is your priority, with no credit or acknowledgement being given to what has been done already. We have been doing this work for over two years. You know, like so many advocates, and in particular African Americans, I've contributed a great deal. I've taken time from my family, school, and work because I'm so passionate about these issues. And time and time again, just been unrecognized. And I never really cared about the recognition because I was always focused on the kids. While you may not view what has occurred as disrespectful, it is. While you may have celebrated the work of the HDCA privately to me via emails, I feel that the work, the time, and the passion of myself, Ms. Lang Law, and Ms. Ronan has not been appreciated on the scale that it deserves. You have minimized our role and contributions. I watch so many meetings, and I've heard discussions about events and initiatives that we've already done. This is wrong. I just can't let sit by and let others take credit over and over again for our work. Dr. Kavanaugh, you might remember shortly before you were hired as our new superintendent, we had a lengthy phone call about some of my expectations. One of them was addressing racial incidents publicly. I expressed to you that Dr. McLeod didn't address the young woman who was called a nigger public, publicly, and that was very upsetting to many people. And I was hoping that you would be a person who would address these things more publicly. In the last year, we have seen many letters issued to the public, one about a bullet being found in the high school, swastika, threats, etc. When I asked you to issue a letter about what happened to my daughter, being told that black people suck, and there's a word for them that begins with an N, you declined. Let that sink in. What parents wouldn't want to know that young children are using this inappropriate language? Well, according to the limited survey results that were recently shared with the public, there's apparently many parents who don't find a problem with this language and think the schools are handling diversity issues well. So what does this mean? Should we just let it all go because there are so few black children in the district? No. For just a moment, imagine yourselves attending an all black school and being on the receiving ends of comments about your hair and your skin and how you talk, your accent. Nigger, your skin is ugly. Faggot, kill yourself. Terrorist, retard, you're so poor. Build a wall. These are words and negative actions towards other others based on these words are in the daily vocabulary of many of our students. What are you going to do about it? I don't want my daughters to end up with stories like Shakima or any of the other students on their journey to adulthood. School should be a safe place, not only physically, but emotionally. Dr. Kavanaugh, I implore you and the school committee to please take into consideration how our current administration does not visually reflect the community it serves. Of course, the best person should always be hired for a job, but it's not hard to call a college or grad school diversity office and ask if they have any candidates who might be a good fit for some of our positions here. When I volunteer in the schools, 
of course my daughter is excited you know to have mommy come and spend some time with her and her classmates but there's also a look of relief on her face that she is seeing an adult who looks just like her through my work in the community and as chair of the youth commission kids of all backgrounds ask me all the time if i'm a teacher one of the most memorable moments i've had since starting the HDCA was in the creation of our logo. I reached out to the visual arts director at the high school to see if she wanted to offer designing our logo as a student contest. As I worked with the student over email for months, the student's race never even crossed my mind. When the logo was complete and it was time for us to meet, I will never forget the sight of this beautiful, dark-skinned African-American female teenager with a huge afro, her bright eyes and wide smile running down the hallway with her arms stretched out to hug me. What she said next is something I actually think about every single day. Tamoria, where have you been? How did I not know you were here? How did I not know about this group or your work? Her name is Lauren Tompkins. So let's go back to the beginning. Let's think about all the kids who fit into that other box I talked about earlier. How will they thrive? How can we ensure that they receive the school experience that every child deserves? Positive, uplifting, academically satisfying, building the type of confidence it takes to sit here in front of all of you and tell the truth about what they've lived through. Because that's the kind of child I wanna raise children. I have two daughters. How will children know who is here to support them if the schools don't collaborate with people who represent them? I want to take a moment to express my sincere gratitude to the HDCA parent advisors and everyone who supported the HDCA along the way. I would like to extend a special thank you to Don Ronan and Natalie Langlois. The three of us were perfect examples of what allies should be. Our differences in race, age, and socio socioeconomics have never been a factor in developing the strong bond that we share or the passion for the work that we've done together. We've leaned on each other as we rode the waves of this journey. We remained aware of all the needs all the time. I never want you to think that we failed. We helped so many people, and just me being here today to share our story shows how much we've accomplished. It's hard to move a needle. We didn't maybe move it as far as we wanted to, but it's important to recognize that it was moved. Because of our work, many lives were improved and more will continue to be. Thank you. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I wanted to hear what you said. No, I'm just I'm mesmerized. You, you write so well and you speak so well and so meaningfully about your experience and the experience of people in the community. And I'm just grateful for it. Absolutely grateful. Thank you. Thanks. I feel like I'm absorbing a lot of what you said, so I don't want to. I don't want to respond in a way that detracts from the depth of what you said, mm -hmm. so I don't want to just respond off the cuff, I guess would be my. I understand. I was there, as you said, for some of the early conversation, uh, and I missed some of the stuff in the middle because I was not one of the school committee people who was chosen to be part of that mm -hmm. journey, so hearing some of the filling in detail from your perspective is helpful to have that. I think there has been obviously a lot of hurt um, that is hard to publicly hold in a way that I think meets the meaning that it holds, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. that it's, I, I want to absorb a little bit bef more before I take more. I, I want to give an opportunity for other people to 
um, I don't, not to put anyone on the spot because I think it probably is a lot. Um, I, I think for us as a group, I, I don't want to speak for everybody, I don't believe that any disrespect was ever intended. And I, I know that doesn't change the feeling. Uh, and I don't intend to try to go over, like to, I'm not trying to take away from that. But I, it's hard to know the point at which things went off track. And to be able to kind of go back to that exact moment, uh, I, I think the very difficult social media conversations have made it difficult to, to sit authentically like this and have a conversation. It, I, I would agree that the HDCA started a conversation that was not here before. And I know the energy at the beginning does feel like it shifted somewhere along the way. I also think as a, a group, and I would include you and in our entire community, I guess, in that we need to find a way to move forward to, to recognize that there has been some hurt and that we have not all stepped in the right direction. At the right moment, we've said things that maybe didn't, were hard to express in the way that they were intended. But I guess I also want to look to kind of figure out, and I don't think that in the time that we have a, a constraints of mm -hmm. sitting right here, we're going to solve mm -hmm. what we have. But I do want to find a way to, to, to move forward and to find a path that includes the HDCA, because you started something important, but in that it includes, as you said, all the needs of all the people all the time. Uh, that there are, and, and I'm not trying to, I, I'm quoting you, I'm not trying to steal your words. Uh, and to include some of the other people to work together, that some of the other groups to come, if there's a way for all of us to come together and work and find a path forward. I don't know that I, I don't have the answer for that. I don't, that's maybe a separate conversation. Um. I'm very glad that you came and shared all this. Um, I think it was important that um, I know it was a lot of detail and like Nancy said, a lot to absorb. Uh, but I don't think that uh, for me personally, I think I've heard this over and over again and you know, snippets here and there. Um, I think it, it, uh, it takes some time for people to realize what this pain is, what this hurt is when you're not heard, uh, when you're not seen. Right, I think Mr. Nair also spoke earlier about the message that we are sending to our kids, that their voices don't matter, that you're not being heard. Um, I think it's important for us. I, I think, although many times we think that, uh, you know, there's only so much we can do as a school committee, I, I, this is my personal belief, I think collectively we have a lot of authority here. Um, the people have given us the authority and collectively we can affect change. And it is, I think, our duty to make our constituents feel that they do have a voice, that they do matter, that they are seen. Uh, you know, all the stories that you shared, they resonate very well with me. Um, and I think you talked about it. I grew up in a country where I was a majority. And I did not understand the pain of a minority, although I was very friendly and I thought that I was, I was an ally with all the minorities, but I never understood the pain until now. And I know what that is, that low hum that someone spoke up at the survey meeting that we had. There's a low hum. It is not blatant. And you feel it and that pain, I understand it. Um, so thank you for bringing that up and being that voice for the entire community. Um, I also think um, HDCA should absolutely be part of uh, this work that we are doing. You have done that work in the past. You have conducted training. You have done a lot of work in the schools. I think it is very hard for parents 
to come up and speak to administration because of fear of retribution. And many times having a community partner makes it easier to share some of it. Um, so that is, you know, they feel a little bit more protected. So I think that partnership is extremely important. Um, so I, I do hope that that's something we will, we will work on. Um, yeah, I, I just don't know how to make this right. Uh, I think I understand your hurt completely, and the only thing that I can think of is going forward, we make every conscious effort in everything that we do to be inclusive, to be mindful, to be trained to understand better, and be inclusive, be inclusive. Uh, thank you, Tamaria. I've certainly personally learned a lot from you. Thanks. I'm so grateful you repeated stories I've heard before, um, but have repeated publicly the individual experiences of children in this district. Uh, because I think until we hear about those individual experiences, it's very hard for us to gauge the extent to which kids suffer in isolation. Um, and one thing that you've introduced into my life that I've found very valuable, and I think you're one of the reasons why I ran for school committee, um, because I'm ready for the revolution. I don't know what form it's going to take, but I'm ready. I think um, you taught me about the importance of being an ally to someone in need. And you've been an ally to children with special needs, um, as has Dawn. And you've shown support and understanding when it was an unknown world to you, when it was unfamiliar. And I'm really grateful for the courage that took. I'm keenly grateful for the courage it took to come up here and to say this, even though you're very eloquent um, and you write just beautifully, so it's not as hard for you as it might be for others. I mean, it's very, very powerful and wonderful. And so I'm, I'm a little gobsmacked and speechless too, but just immensely grateful for your presence here. Uh, I just want to say also thank you for um, elevating the dialogue, which I don't think I heard mm. before I encountered you and the HCC. So I think um, the awareness and the dialogue is um, much, much richer than it was before. Um, one of the things that, sort of besides echoing what has already been said, which I agree, but one of the things that came out in the um, debrief of the survey results, and I think in actually the stories that you've said, mm -hmm. is where the, some of this comes from, and a lot of it comes from outside the schools, in the community as well. So I, I would be um, interested personally in seeing how we sort of synchronize our efforts um, and work together to address the issue both within the schools and within the community. Because I think a lot of things come from home, and um, a lot of young people who, who repeat things they've heard don't understand, and getting to the source and having conversations with the community as a whole, I think would, um, um, it has to be done in, um, in both fronts. It has to be done in the schools and in the community. And I think somehow we have to do it in a synchronized way. So uh, I think there's a lot we could do together. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And that's one of the reasons why I shared a lot about what's happened to me personally, because I feel like what happens to adults mirrors exactly what happens to the children. So everything that was happening to me was also happening to a lot of students um, that I uh, encountered as well, and even at times my children. You know, I've, I have been attacked. I have been viciously attacked by many adults in the community. But again, due to the nature of my work, I just consider it, I put it in the work box, and I just move forward because it was always about trying to help those who don't have a voice. It's often that adults and mostly children so rarely have an opportunity to share their true feelings and have them validated. And in my work, that is most of what I do is help validate how people feel about the experience that they've had in motherhood, no matter what it is. Letting them know that whatever they feel, they're entitled to feel and that they should be validated and supported through that. So it's all of that that really has carried me through the work in the schools and with the children and with the parents, letting them know 
the things that are happening to you aren't right. Speak up. Don't be afraid. We'll be there side by side to walk this walk with you. So after doing that for two years and then feeling shut out, being shut out, The question is, where do we go from here? How are we going to change this? What steps are going to be taken to be more inclusive? You know, I think I told you this not too long ago. My grandmother had a saying, as most grandmothers do, they have lots of sayings, but there's, <laughs> but there's one that has really guided me through my <coughs> life completely. And the saying was, how a relationship starts is how it will end. And it doesn't matter if it's a relationship, you know, with a ro romantic relationship or a work, a co-working relationship, a relationship with your boss, whatever the friendship. <coughs> so if a relationship starts with respect, it ends in respect. If a relationship starts in deceit, it will end in deceit. And so what I have felt from not being included from the beginning is that we feel like that's exactly how it's going to always be. There's been a loss of trust where we spent years building trust. And so how do we capture that again? And there's really only way, one way to capture that again. And that's by setting a different tone, sending a message, and validating everyone's experience and including them in the work. When the survey was conducted, and we were told that there were 30 district leaders involved in the creation of the survey. Imagine how I feel. I'm the chair of the Youth Commission, the founder of the HDCA. I'm a commissioner for the state of Massachusetts. And I'm the coordinator for half of the state for postpartum resources and support. But here I'm not seen as, as much of a leader to be included in the creation of a diversity survey as an African-American mother of two biracial children in the community in which I live and where my children attend the schools. It sends a message that you're not important. Your voice isn't important to me. I don't want to hear from you. That is exactly how I received, received this. And the same thing happens to the children. That's how they feel in school. So many people, regardless of their race, socioeconomics, religion, gender, needs, are struggling to find their voice, make connections, and build networks of support. And it's our duty to provide that for our children. It's in particular your duty to make sure that that's happening. Um, I, have, I have a couple of things. You know, um, l listening to Timoria, and I think we've had these conversations, and. Um, you know, I, I do want to say that ultimately we all have to work on this together. Mm -hmm. And I do want to say that Dr. Kavanaugh had, has had the vision of wanting to work and she has already taken a lot of steps in this direction. And I'm looking for us to think of ways where we can bring all of this together. And I feel the five of us can do something about this. Um, so a couple of things I've jotted down as a possible things to think of. One, um, I think as a school committee, we should probably get some training ourselves. Uh, what it looks like to set an example um, that we are willing to put in the effort to learn what this means, what, it, what does it feel. Uh, I think there have been videos that have been posted outside and I would like to take the help of HDCA in getting us trained, uh, I would want that or look to other resources, we can look at that. I would want that as setting an example. Maybe we televise it, maybe we take HCAMP's um, help there. The second um, is something I think uh, we had brought up when the new school board came on board was to have a diversity and racial equity subcommittee. We had talked about it multiple times. I would like to propose a motion to actually form that and include HDCA in it. Um, I would want to bring that up, and I just want to hear everyone's thoughts. Absolutely. So I would, I would say the one thing that's going to be challenging is I think a number of us are going to want to do that together. I don't know 
we have to figure out how I don't think we can make that motion on the fly because I think there are going to be a number of us that want to be hands on working in by us I mean not just the HDCA but I think us at the table here uh, and I think there may be other organizations that we should not close out as well right so I'm not suggesting Nancy that we close out yep. on on anyone in fact I saw later in the agenda I actually really like that idea called the bridge I love the name um, and I would want to see that expanded beyond the social um, the economic part of it to make it broader I like I said I fell in love with that word because we have been struggling to find what's the right word the bridge Fantastic. Can we expand that to include um, more issues related to diversity and inclusion? And I think that what I'm seeking for a motion here, I think we have done this with the website subcommittee uh, when we decided that we'll have it. But what it would mean is we start the work you know, of thinking who all should be in it. I know there are new uh, groups that have been formed in, in town that could be part of this, but I would really like to see some action. I think it's high time we do this. That's my take. So I think action is an excellent idea. I do not want to take action right now, though. I want us to absorb everything that Tamoria has said and bring it back on November 1st would be my and I can come back on November 1st if uh, you need me to. I think it's important to, to absorb. You know, even before I started speaking, I thought I was going to just say to you guys, you know what, maybe you should just absorb what I've said, yeah. and then if we could meet again. Because I'm sure if you rewatch it, you know, you'll probably develop even more of a deeper understanding, maybe take away some things you weren't able to take away in the moment especially when I'm sitting here right in front of you, I think, you know, it's, it's worth doing that. I appreciate you saying this. I mean, again, I speak for myself, and I think Nancy speaks mm -hmm. for herself, and, mm -hmm. you know, we have other members, too. The, the thing in my mind is this is not the first time I've heard this. I have heard this over and over again. Mm -hmm. I have seen it over and over again. We have heard it as a result of this survey. I have sat through that forum. A year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and I felt we left saying we need tools, mm -hmm. and here we are. We are still saying the same things. We need tools, and the time is moving on, and it's the kids who are facing it. It's well, not us. Well, here's what I'm hearing. So every time, you know, that this comes up, okay, now we're talking about another group. No offense to this other group, but now everything that I've done again is being diminished and okay well now we're going to also make sure this other group does diversity and inclusion issues I'm not here for that I just want to make that clear you know I'm solely focused on all the things that I've laid out for you tonight I don't wish to be a part of another organization or another committee I'm already on two and that's plenty you know I'm sure you guys feel the same way sometimes <laughs> with everything that goes on in here you know so it seems to me that energy is always being redirected from the HDCA to other organizations or other ideas. And quite frankly, I've had enough. I want it focused here because we built it. It's already established. It doesn't mean that other people can't participate or that we don't want to collaborate. But something that a lot of you fail to realize but may be aware of is that in our efforts over the last two years to collaborate with other organizations, we were flat out turned down. You know, and I've tried to spare some of these individuals embarrassment tonight. So I held back a little bit. And so when it comes to collaborations, like I mentioned earlier, and wanting to involve other people, it's a fantastic idea. Who wouldn't want to collaborate? Most of my life is collaborating with other people to push legislation, right? I have to collaborate with everyone on all sides of all these issues to get things done. But when I've tried it right here, it doesn't work. And I think we just need to face the music and say, it doesn't work because people don't respond well to who I am. It's hard to see a black person in a leadership role. I don't get treated the same as anybody else, and most people know it, but they just don't want to say it. My emails don't get responded to. And then I'll have another member of HDCA send an email to someone and they get a response back like that. Even for MLK Day last year, 
It took no less than 10 emails for me to have my flyers posted. You know, it's, it's these things, the low hum. It's all the little things, you know. And so now I sit here again, and I've bared, you know, the, this two years of work to everyone, and this is what I hear. Oh, there's this other group that also we can uh, include in this stuff too. Really? <laughs> so, uh, Timothy, I, mean, I, I just want to um, say something, right? I don't think I'm necessarily, you know, I think this is something that has been coming, right, in my opinion, wanting to create the space and the work that needs to be done where community members are actively involved in this. And you have been the voice, right? So I don't think that, in, in my opinion, I think this, this is what I see as two things that we should do. One is set the example and set the tone in terms of getting some training ourselves. And the second is, I don't know if it's the expansion of the bridge uh, that's coming up later or how we want to go about it, but I do think we, we need community participation. And perhaps Dr. Cavanaugh has some ideas in the space because we have talked about that for a while now. So that's where I am with it. Um, I don't know what everyone else thinks. I just want to comment on the, the training piece. I 100% I agree that I think that would be beneficial to us. Um, and one of the things that I've learned as a new school committee member is that it's a really interesting job being on school mm -hmm. committee because we're not operationally involved in the schools, So, but we are representing the voice of the people. So like when the survey was done, it was an operational assign like it was the staff that works for the school department that did the survey. So it was an operational um, activity to, as I understood it, to educate the admin and the staff and start a journey that I think I, what I appreciated was that Dr. Cavanaugh made it a first priority as a superintendent. I think there is a shared commitment to diversity. Maybe the approach was different. I'm not, I, I learned some history I didn't know. Um, some of it, a lot of it I knew, some of it I didn't know. So, um, but I think it's this, it's this interesting bridge between the community and the operational side. And so when you talk about training, I've been very curious about the training the staff received, the admin received, because I think there's um, sort of book study work and training that has gone on within the schools. I'm also interested in the training that the HUCA could provide. I didn't sit in on that either. I would be interested to hear the, the difference and, and understand we are the bridge. So I'd kind of like to hear how aligned the messages and the training is and, and is sort of here at both. I don't know. I mean, well, I wasn't I, in the admin training and I, I'm not a teacher who was in mm -hmm. the middle school training or, um, so I like the idea, um, but I don't, I don't want to disrespect the work that I think Dr. Kavanaugh boldly walked into within the first month. I think that took a lot of courage and I think there's a commitment to activity and I think the activity that I see within the schools um, is, starting at the top and creating awareness and self-reflection among the teachers and the staff and the admin, I think that it was started, again, between you and the principals operationally within the buildings before and with Dr. McLeod. But it's all good. Like, I, for me, I don't know. I feel like we can find, I, I want to support the work that's going on. I want to get at the community messages and the education as well outside, and I want a bridge. I want us to be a bridge somehow. So. I don't know. I don't know where that takes us, but I think when we do training, I'd kind of like to hear um, how we understand what the admin has learned and how we understand what the HGCA has learned and can share with us both. Uh, thank you for your comment. Um, I agree with some things. One thing I want to caution you about, because I felt like it's kind of leaning towards this feeling like I'm disrespecting Dr. Kavanaugh, and that's why I started off the conversation with outlining the positive experience, experiences we've had. But as we all know, as public officials and public figures, we have to stand up to questioning. And so because I like her personally and think she's an awesome person, I do disagree with a lot of things. And I will question it. And I will outline exactly what my experience has been. That's not disrespectful. It's just being honest about my personal experience and the experiences that my group member has had. So I just want to make that clear. I know you probably didn't mean it that I way, didn't but you it's, were it, right, I know, yeah. but it's leaning that way, and so I want to correct it. Well, I, that's more, how the I tone... didn't more actually what Mina said, because yeah. Mina was indicating 
that we've we've been kind of stuck in a holding pattern for a couple of years, and she's heard the same thing. Yeah. I see forward motion, so I didn't want to disrespect the forward motion that I see. Mm -hmm. That's where I was going with that. But see, I see no forward motion okay. because it's, if you listen to everything I said, you can see it's just stop, start, stop, start, stop, start at every turn. Okay. So that's our experience. We're still exactly almost, you know, in the same place we were when we began mm -hmm. because we were stopped from doing what we were doing. We haven't been included mm -hmm. in any of the work. Even when it came to um, the teacher trainings with Khalees Wernham, I asked Dr. Kavanaugh if, the, if HDCA members could attend, and she said no because they would be uncomfortable. We wanted to understand what they were learning so that we could assist them just like we had been assisting them all this time with the workshops for the teachers and the students. It's only helpful, again, if we all are on the same page and we're all sharing information. That's all the HDCA has sought to do, is to truly be partners, not come in and tell teachers they're doing a bad job or they don't care about kids or they're racist. I have found quite the opposite. Sure, I've outlined some horrific things to you tonight, but I guarantee most of the teachers that I've um, had the experience of working with personally and other HDCA members would tell you, and I have letters from them too, would tell you that we've had a wonderful time collaborating um, and our workshops and just our and you know, everything we have a lot of fun with them but you can't be inclusive if you don't include one of our main issues is socioeconomics and racism two main issues right so I'm the only black parent who has stepped up and volunteered to be an active voice an active partner in this work but yet I'm not included in surveys, trainings, and key decision making. I'm not an employee of the schools. However, again, we were recognized as an important partner at a certain point, and that's all come to a, to a standstill. And we're struggling to understand why. How are you going to learn if you don't know any black people, if you don't talk <coughs> to black parents with black children or white parents with black children? How are you going to know what to do about certain situations? How are you not going to constantly walk into minefield after minefield? And that's what's holding everyone back. It's the fear. And here I was. I said, don't be afraid. I'm black. I'll tell you exactly what offends us and, you know, don't worry about it. You know, let's just get it all out. But it wasn't good enough. I think I'd like to just talk a little bit about that notion of fear um, because I'm not exactly sure that, and, and I certainly don't want to discredit your perception of what has happened over the last couple of years, um, but, and I don't also want to speak on behalf of all of the teachers and the administrators in the district, but I can say that there have been times when teachers or administrators have made decisions and when those have been met with disagreement by people in the HDCA that becomes wildly, I guess, sort of publicized. Um, so at some point, you know, I, I think our administrators um, and maybe even some teachers would be sort of reluctant to take risks in particular settings. I don't think we have ever allowed parents or outside groups into our professional learning. So when we hired people like the ADL or Khalees Warnham to do that kind of work, we were certainly not ostracizing anyone, but we were doing our own professional learning. Can you name any specific examples of things on social media that you're referring to? Um, I, I think I would prefer not to go there. Well, see, I think it's really unfair to bring it up, but not give me an example, because again, can I just? I, I don't want to. I just. I feel like we're sort of out of order here. I really you appreciate too. I was your passion stay. and your I'm commitment, and I absolutely. I think we're all yeah. in agreement that this is something that needs to be taken care of. But I feel like we are no longer discussing the specifics, and we're starting to get into. Um, things that I think are inappropriate for this, for, for, for school committee purposes. Well, so, I, didn't, I didn't bring it up. I'm responding no, no, to what No, absolutely, and me. so I just want to cut everybody off and say I, I'm uncomfortable with the conversation. I'm pretty sure we're out of order. I think we've gone and, and sort of branched off beyond open meeting laws, regulations, and I really would, you know, make a request that we, if we could table the discussion, absorb, as everyone has already commented, absorb what we've heard, think about what we really think, and then move forward either in future agenda items or whenever it is appropriate for us to make the next step, 
tomorrow, two weeks from now, whatever that time is. Um, but I do feel like the discussion is starting to spiral from productive to unproductive, and I feel very uncomfortable that it's moving in this direction. So I respectfully request that well, we Well, I'm just trying to understand at what point you you decided that it spiraled. Was it my comment or what the Dr. No, Kavanaugh's no, comment? No, no, I just I feel like we, we, we are sort of beyond the point of productive conversation when we start to bring up social media. I didn't bring up the like social this. media. Uh, but I'm not saying that you did. I'm just saying when yeah, we I just want to make it clear. For sure. I but did not when bring up the bring social up, media. I think, it's, I think it's time to end the conversation. The agenda item was for 15 minutes. It's been an hour and 15 minutes. I feel like we've, we've certainly heard and respect all that you've said, but I do think, in my opinion, it's time to move on. It doesn't feel to respectful to be cut off in the middle of a sentence when I'm responding to something that was said about me and the group. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that that's the way you perceive it. That's what happened. So I feel like we started with the energy of your presentation, and it felt like we were trying to absorb that energy, and I do feel like our energy is moving away from that in a way that and I'm not, yes. I, I don't want to say any one of our comments or your comment or anybody's, that, but I feel like I want to bring us back before we move on to the weight of everything that you said at the beginning and to this desire to find some healing, I guess, for all of the work that we would like to move ahead with in hope that we can find a way to partner that would be productive for all of us. Um, and this was what I started with when I spoke, was that I was concerned with us responding too much would take away from what had been said. I think from my hope before tonight was that this would be a first step in trying to have a conversation and mm -hmm. to bring out a, some difficult conversation. I do think that given that it is 8.30, we probably do need to move on, though. Do okay, so can I take this as a first step and that we will have an invitation to come back? So we will have, there will be an invitation to move forward with the work. I don't know that the work will happen in this forum right here or if there, if it will happen in a different way, but that we, I, I, and I'm going to speak for myself because we didn't have an official motion, would like to see the HDCA work valued for the work that you've done and recognize the conversation that you have started and to work with us in the direction that the work is going. It is not typically the work that would be done as a whole committee until it comes, it, it would be probably discussed in other ways either, I, I don't want to say off the cuff because I don't want to mm -hmm. misstate, yeah. and then brought back to the committee at the appropriate time that in and out kind of different different ways of moving forward. I mean, I, so, so go ahead, Mike. I'm just, I don't know why we're hedging here because I've learned a lot tonight. Yes. And I think regular reports from the HDCA, yeah. like monthly, bi-monthly reports would be absolutely welcome. And I think it will help reduce some of whatever tension has collected over time if we just keep working together. I mean, the student council comes and gives a report. I think CPAC is gonna come give a report. Other groups come give reports. Why can't we have reports? Because it's uncomfortable. And listen, I just wanna make ahead, another no, I comment here. Um, it's shocking to sit here tonight and hear that there were all these negative uh, assumptions or conversations about things because they've never come our way. So imagine working with people for two years, having over 50 meetings face to face with principals and admins and two different superintendents and you feel like you're working towards one goal and then to find out, oh well behind your back or you know, actually, they were all really uncomfortable with everything the whole time. I mean, I'm really struggling to understand because this is the first time I've heard that. Are you talking about the social media? Yeah, I mean, we've never had a problem like with meetings or this, you know, I've never heard this before. So, we need so to I, I, really I think to. we need to come back to that piece. Cause okay, I, I well, do. this is something if, to be, it, you know, I didn't bring it up. I, no, I know you it didn't, but I, I do feel like, it, and I did not say social media. 
just flew okay. And maybe it was so, me, but I, I think the point is, this is not the venue, nor is it the time or the place to have a discussion about that. We very much wanted to hear the report. We very much wanted to hear what you had to say, but I don't think deliberation, discussion, or a motion is appropriate at this particular time. Well, when is the right time and the right place? I'm just curious. I'm just trying to understand. I, re I, mean, I really am. I'm not trying to be yeah, contentious. I'm just asking. I, I, so I just don't to have know time. the rules and right. so what, it, it, what this is new territory, not just because of the topic of conversation, but mm -hmm. because it is not, it, you, you are sort of a trailblazer because CPAC is now coming to give a report after you, in, I think, in our next meeting as well. It is not okay. typical to have mid-year reports like okay. this or on regular, but it is something that I think we are interested in pursuing. I don't, again, want to respond off the cuff. I hear you. I, I understand wanna... where you're coming from, too, Nancy. I'm not trying to force your hand. I, I don't feel but like But I also you are. can't sit here and not say something. May I add something? Yeah. And I've never met you. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, no, I get permission but, but from so, you. So, yes, but so I want to just to scope in the same box that we are going to try to move on to. But go ahead. I do. I appreciate yes. that. Trust me. <laughs> um, I've never met you, Tamoria. Um, certainly, I've heard about your work here. And you've done a lot in this community. Um, my, I guess my feeling right now and my agreement with there being no further action tonight, and I speak as an administrator in this district and as a school committee member in another district, there are so many level, levels and layers to the roles of what school committee members can do and the role that they actually play in the administration of the school district. So school committee members typically, they do budget, they write policy, mm -hmm. they deal with hiring a superintendent. And this has so many arms, and it's such a deep, critical topic that I'm not even sure, and I'm processing all this information myself tonight, mm -hmm. I'm not even sure that school committee is the right, right venue for this. And I can't say tonight what it is, mm -hmm. um, but I am concerned that this committee might be going down a road where it, it isn't school committee business. And all these people are very involved, and I'm not disrespecting your involvement in your work, but there may be other venues more appropriate than tonight um, for, to Jen's point about the actual roles of the school committee. That might be something the school committee should carefully look at be, before we consider, and I appreciate it's I, not my meeting, yep, but I no, apologize, I, I, but I, I did not want to cut, um, it, it, I am cognizant of the time primarily because we haven't gotten to any of our agenda really. Well, it's, that's okay. In, this is a really important conversation we're having. I feel like we're telling the truth in ways we sometimes don't. So I'm okay spending the time doing this. Um, I mean, I want to hear what's happening on the ground with students in the school and what kind of stress is they're facing. And when I did my mask training back in June with Amanda, I remember being told that as a school committee, you can use this time not just for a business meeting, but for workshops to help deepen your understanding of the issues that are besetting the kids here. So I'm clearly not an experienced school committee member, um, but my feeling is this is really important to listen to. Who cares if school committee isn't the right venue? You know, whoopee. But this is important. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't think there's a law that says you cannot speak about this here. It's an important venue with people who care about the topic. It is, but I think we also have to respect the positions of your other committee members too. You know, as a chairperson, you know, I, I, you know, expect that type of respect, and it's usually given. And so, you know, I can understand how you guys do have to accept that there might be limitations and explore I, other I options. I would say limit. Oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I would say limitations to tonight. Yeah, I but I, I absolutely do want to move forward and use this as a first step, mm -hmm. and I don't want to. In moving on, I don't want to give the impression to you or to anybody at this table or countless people who may or may not be watching mm -hmm. um, that I would ever not want to come back. It's important to me to come back to this, but I also want to go back to the absorbing piece and sure. to feel the enormity of all that we've had conversations but with. part of the absorbing is going to be able to have we have to discuss some of those we, things that we have do. happened we that, do. I, that I'm not aware of and the reactions to certain things if something negative is going to be brought up to me or about me in this group I will absolutely or I deserve the chance to respond and to defend it I'm not saying okay, tonight, so I, I but I'm saying I, in general yes, I don't when 
I'm well, just saying in general, yeah. not necessarily tonight, because I think we've covered that this isn't the right time, place, venue, da, da, da. But I would caution anyone from making bold statements that have never been brought up to me before and not allowing me the opportunity to respond properly. Nancy, if I may, I think I agree that we need to keep the conversation productive and respectful. And I think Timoria had said at the very beginning that she does respect Dr. Cavanaugh deeply, and so do yeah. all of us. And I personally have said it a million times over, I think in private and in public, and I will use the word social media, that I really applaud that you have taken that step. It takes a lot of courage to do that. We just need to find a way to make this all work together and move forward. And I know I was proposing some of these things. My uh, concern is that we, as five members, don't get an opportunity outside of this forum to sit and discuss and talk about the next steps. Exactly. So that's the challenge, right? So here we are. We have an opportunity. So maybe the motion is, or not a motion, or maybe a thought, that we are going to discuss this. We're going to absorb this, and at the next meeting, we, we can talk about you know what are the possible next steps and we can all think about it and come back with that, whether it is training or what have you or any other thoughts. But I think it's important to think of some next steps because otherwise we have this conversation and then there is a break again, right? And, and it does impact kids, right? And again, there's a lot of work that Dr. Kavanaugh is doing. So I think perhaps at the next meeting, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh could share some of the work that she has planned out in this area, which I know she, she does, with all the training that they've already undertaken. And you know the service has taken a lot of those steps. So I, I think to be fair, we need to give her that opportunity to prepare and perhaps come back with her ideas. And maybe we take it from there. And the ideas that I have thrown out, whether it is our own training, or you know, um, another venue, the bridge, to mm -hmm. take this work forward. Uh, perhaps there's a thing to think that, about. I um, think that we have to get over the hump of shutting down when things get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that this is a really tough venue as school committee members and officials to do all of this in. But as soon as things get uncomfortable, everybody shuts down. Can't talk about this. Can't do this. Can't do that. And that's usually what has happened to us, and as we know, to a lot of students. And we have got to move past those things. But how can we do it if we don't really consciously focus on, I'm going to have to accept that this is the reality. I'm going to have to accept being uncomfortable right now. I'm going to have to accept this other person's experience and really reflect and dwell on this. And really sit in an uncomfortable moment and just deal with it. You know, actively listening to what's going on, not rushing to a response, rushing to defend, rushing to prove that you weren't being disrespectful or, you know, anything else. That is really the challenge across the board, is moving everyone past, as soon as we get uncomfortable, shutting down. I'm going to give you the last word yes. and make that the last word. Um, and a heartfelt thank you, and I would like to, to take some time to reflect, put something on the November 1st agenda for figuring out what we're, where we, the five of us are going, and then reach back um, okay, to great. you, if that's okay. Great. Thank you all very much. I thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you. And thank you for your hard work. Is it midnight? It is not. Um, the night is still young. So with that, um, we're going to shift into a budget report with Ms. Rothermick. Thank you. Um, so the budget report and the financial report are pretty much the same thing. So if you go to the financial report, the first, the cover um, of that financial report outlines all of the FTEs that have been requested of the school committee, really from the increase in enrollment um, and the change in some of the demographics of, of students that, that have moved in. Um, so the increasing challenges of class sizes and needs of those students that have moved in. So you see that summary of the FTEs. 
The next part really is your financial year-to-date budget um, with the expected projection through the end of the year. Um, so in terms of expenses, it's a little more difficult to really project all the way out to the end of the year because we're still very early on in, in the budget season. Salaries, what we've done is we've reflected um, attrition for any um, staff that have left and have been hired, hopefully at lower salaries. Um, we also, within salary reserve, had your three contracts, the teacher contract, the um, paraprofessional contract, and the nurse's contract estimate. So this also reflects the, um, the actual in taking that and, and putting it to, applying it to the people. Um, so it was housed in one line, and then it was applied to the people as the contracts were settled. So that's why you see really a lot of variance within the salary piece, um, is really just the application of those contracts. In a contract year, you'll, you'll see that. Ms. Rothmeck, uh, for the benefit of everyone, can you explain a little bit about the salary reserve fund? So within the salary reserve fund, that is where we put in an estimate of what the, the teacher contract increase would be, what the paraprofessional contract increase would be, what anyone who is not under a contract increase would be. So it, that's all housed in there because nothing has been defined during budget season. So as the contracts were settled, um, you know, then that actual raise is applied to the person. I see. Now, um, where, when we budget for new hires, as we do as part of the process, uh, for instance, you know, uh, I see uh, there were eight ELL teachers that we hired, right? And then the two additional that request came in later. So, was the eight under the salary reserve? No, we. You had. That's a separate line item. Right. That's within the budget. You had already budgeted. Okay. You had only requested two additional. Okay. The others were already in the budget. I see. So the salary reserve is primarily the 2.5% or whatever that increase That's correct. is that you have budgeted for. That's correct. Okay. Because I think one of the things um, that, you know, comes to my mind is that when we have, uh, you know, new requests coming in, we have, I think I asked you last time and you talked about going to the uh, prepay. Mm -hmm. and that being one of the sources, as well as uh, any um, uh, vacation time that the teachers use. So there's some salary that comes out of it. Like if, if the teachers have completed or used up all their vacation time. Well, right. not vacation. So um, if a teacher is out on a family medical leave, right. okay, they get a certain number of weeks that they can use their sick time. Right. Once they go beyond that FMLA leave, they revert into unpaid sick time, right. not vacation. Right, yeah, sorry. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, it sounded like someone's going to Aruba. Uh, no, that's not what I meant. So thank you for correcting me there. Um, and so again, that's all separate, but this salary reserve is purely whatever is the anticipated Estimated increase. Estimated increases okay. in contract. Oh, fantastic, thank you. So those first couple of pages, as I said, is where you see the projection through the end of the year. Um, so at this point in time, we have a very small positive projected variance of 32,000. Um, so we're still right now holding our own. Um, and again, we did, we used up all of our salary reserve and you'll see that with the budget transfers. I don't know if this is an easy segue to something sure. that's later on. Um, you'll see that we, the other recommended um, places to cover those additional FTEs uh, in addition to salary reserve was using up um, the pre, some of the prepaid uh, transportation that was in there and also a energy rebate that, that came. And you'll see that as part of the uh, budget transfer which is later on in the agenda. Are there any other questions on the actual financial report? I just wanted to point out one thing that we had talked about. Um, Susan was very 
patient and explaining the financial report to me in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, which was really helpful. But um, we're showing that narrow surplus, but we also had approved at our, I think last, or one of the recent school committee meetings, um, a 1.6 high school FTE to start in the middle of the year, roughly around 60,000 was estimated. So it's tight. I mean, it, I think it, it's tight, even though we look like we have a small surplus, it's, to me, it looks really tight. It is tight. Yeah. Um, and there are things that haven't really exactly, I think, hit yet or so. Yeah, I mean, uh, with the growth that we have had, um, I would imagine it is. And all the additional teachers and staff that we've had to hire. Um, I appreciate all the detail in this it is I know complicated for those of us who do not have that background that you have to sometimes grasp the yeah and I'm, I'm more than willing you know as Amanda said I'm more than willing to sit down with anyone who wants to do this offline and just you know make sure that you really do have a full understanding I mean this is this is your charge you know budget and policy so this is 50% Any other uh, questions or comments? No. Okay. All right, then I've got to scroll back up. So this is a <coughs> wonderful segue because um, when uh, Mrs. Fargiana was just saying that um, things are tight, uh, I did meet with the kindergarten teachers uh, yesterday afternoon. Jen and I were both there, and we spent a good hour with them. Um, we've had a new student move into the district at center who requires a one-to-one -one paraprofessional. Um, and you will remember that during our summertime meeting, given the fact that we had an energy rebate, we were we added um, three or four pairs to the um, kindergarten level. And while historically they've had a single pair matched up to every single teacher, this was the year that we had said that they were going to share a pair across two classrooms. Um, but Jen and I also met with the kindergarten teachers in the summertime, and we sort of heard their concern that they were moving into a brand spanking new building and not only would the teachers be unfamiliar with it and the kindergarten kids and the first grade kids, um, so it was going to be a pretty difficult transition, they felt, from going from center school to marathon. So since the start of the year, they've had 10 pairs across 13 classrooms, and I think that we're going to need to move them to nine pairs across 13 classrooms because the funding just isn't there to add an additional pair right now. And. Um, to some of the kindergarten teachers' credit, um, they did say that if you know they had an easier class this year, they were sort of willing to take uh, their paraprofessional and give it to a person who had a more challenging classroom behaviorally or, or whatever. So I think that um, we are going to be able to make that work, but they do have, I, I do want to express on their behalf, concern that um, they are going to be down one paraprofessional moving forward. But the good news is the kids have routines and, and we're, we're plugging away at it. So um, let's see, a couple of other things. Next week is STEAM Week in Massachusetts. Perhaps you saw the great big banner here. Um, in every single classroom at every single grade lesson, grade level, there are lessons um, to be embedded for the S, T, E, A, and M days. So there will be a science, technology, engineering, um, art and design, and mathematic lesson going across uh, the district. And I probably shouldn't say in every single class at every single grade level, but you know the science department here and the science department at the middle school has, have done some work around that. But um, I think K to five, there are, are lessons embedded every single day to celebrate STEAM in Massachusetts. So uh, I hope that uh, things will be tweeted out to you and you'll see it in Instagram, you'll see it on social media because it's kind of a big celebration for us um, and the last thing um, yesterday I went to HCAM and I want to have this be no spoiler alert here um, met with uh, Mary Ellen Grady and Samantha Harris who are both middle school teachers they are conducting some mindfulness work so the exciting part of what they are doing is um, not only do they do this all the time with the students at the middle school so that you know they're working on things like love and empathy along with that sort of you know sort of um, 
getting themselves into good sp spaces to learn academically. But Mary Ellen and Samantha are going to be running a course for parents in mindfulness so that they have an understanding of what their children do every day in the middle school. Um, so be watching for that. That's great. Yeah, it is. It's exciting. Yes. So, and that's all I have. That's great. Thank you. So that moves us into the school committee chair report, and I just want to say I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrants 19-026, 19-027, 19-028, 19-029, 19-030, 19-031, 19-032, and 19-033. All warrants have been included in your packet. I have approved for payment also the payroll warrants S19008. And that moves us um, into liaison reports. So I would like to um, offer up if people want to. I don't, I don't mean to put people on the spot down on that end, but. I have just a quick one from the good old website committee. We are um, forging ahead, and we have a public forum on this coming Tuesday, October 23rd, um, right here. 6.30 to 8 p.m. Everybody's welcome. Anybody who has um, thoughts or experiences with the website to share or ideas about um, the future website, we're really looking to get our requirements um, and priorities um, under well understood from the community. So if you want to come, please join us. Um, it should be fun. I am actually want to just say that I'm so excited to see all that you have you've been sending out the committee. I'm thinking, um, Amanda, a lot of it coming from you. You know, just how it's organized and how you're doing all the work, it's amazing. I'm I'm looking forward um, to I'm hoping it'll be a mind blowing website. Okay. I'm just looking forward to it. And I think you have the process right and you've been so inclusive in, in the entire process. Thank you. Our committee is excellent. I will say the parents are really well engaged, and um, the staff who are on it, they, everyone's engaged. So I think the committee is vested. So that's good. I will say the shock that I think has come out of this work is that the respondents of the survey, so many responded that they did not really look at the school committee website. <laughs> but wait till Mina and May get our new content up there. It's going to be. <laughs> then it will be coming in just herds of people to see it. Thank you. Do you want to do the sure, CPAC? Sure, sure. So, uh, so CPAC uh, met on Tuesday, as a matter of fact, and the three um, Hopkins Middle School and high school principals were there to talk a little bit about some of the inclusion and things they have going on in their building. I, th I was very impressed, really, some wonderful things going on in the buildings. Uh, the Knowing Our Differences program, I think, is, is it next week? Under Sorry, Understanding Our Differences is next week, I believe. Is that, or the training is? It actually goes throughout the entire okay. year. Yeah. Uh, so they, it, but to hear a little bit more about that program and to hear a little bit more about the best buddies in the program that is similar but different at Hopkins was really exciting. A little bit of talk about ESY and changes that will be coming up with that, um, and then also I, it, it was I thought a good, good energy in the meeting. So. Yeah, we had eight administrators. Yeah. and nine parents <laughs> so we could have done a skirmish on the new turf field. you know perhaps perhaps Next we could time. save that for the warmer <laughs> weather but I, I think that there was a, a feeling of, of gratitude that so many people were there listening because I think yeah. the first thing anyone needs to do is listen and then I, go away and think <laughs> I, I think that is a theme listening and that thinking is the theme. thank you I have a short one. Um, the Marathon School ESBC <laughs> met um, the other day. Uh, there's a short punch list that they've been largely knocking off over the last couple of days, which is great. So there's very few things on the list of s sort of things to do. Um, while we were there, they were inspecting the roof. <laughs> the roof guys were on ladders out the window, making sure that everything was all set before the snow falls and the ice starts. So hopefully that um, passed. Yeah, yeah. He came in. He gave the thumbs up. He said everything looks good. Um, there's, uh, you know, as we're looking at the, the the finances, it it every indication is that there will be um, money that we approved that we won't need to spend. So, you know, the concern was we can't really say there's money coming back to the town. Of course, it's not coming back to the town. It's just money that we're not spending. So the debt will be less, which is great news. Um, 
we did talk a little bit about some um, concerns about parking during pickup and drop off, um, which um, Lauren is is working on, I, according to discussion at the meeting. So um, I don't know the details of it, but um, I know that she's aware of it, and so um, she's going to working on some adjustments, and we'll see how things fall. And um, but there was just discussion of it, so that if anything needed to be adjusted in terms of parking. Um, we they were looking to get feedback about it um, while we're, we're still continuing to meet and then um, and then there was a big discussion about a neighbor um, to the building whose yard ha has continued to experience some flooding and so that's also an ongoing um, investigation if you will um, trying to figure out what the cause of this flooding is where the water is coming from so um, that wasn't resolved either, but ongoing decision <coughs> to make sure we're good neighbors to the community here. And that's it. Um, I, I have a couple. Um, one is, um, I think last time uh, when we had the meeting, I talked a little bit about our conversation with the planning board um, chair and uh, also A.B. Ritterbush. Uh, we had met and we had talked about possibly forming a group of citizens and I provided that update. So as part of that work, um, I reached out to a few names that I had suggested, uh, you know, just make it a little bit more inclusive and try to get some new members. And so I had reached out to Leah Battle Rafferty, Tanya Barua, um, Gunajit Mehdi, and Rajiv Nambiar. So I had reached out to these people to check if they have any interest uh, and joining a group of uh, folks who would look to um, the growth that we are seeing in town and the impact not just to the schools but overall and how um, we could look for some innovative ways to solve <coughs> it, right? Um, so it's again still very early and I'm looking uh, to Ms. Kramer for lead here. She had mentioned that this is something that would come up in the Monday planning board meeting. Unfortunately, I could not join in. You know, it's not yet, although HCAM is always very prompt, it's not yet up. So I couldn't follow up yet. So more to come on that uh, front. So that's something that's going on, some conversations around that. Um, the second one is on the website, the school committee update. Uh, Meg and I um, did some work on the verbiage. I think the primary uh, uh, you know, feedback was around the mission, vision, and uh, uh, you know, the goals, et cetera. So that we wanted to, we made some changes, but we want to take some time and you know, reflect on it before we bring it back to the committee uh, as a whole. So, but we did some work on that front. Um, also, uh, Amanda made the suggestion that the ownership of the school committee menu, um, that it's fairly easy to edit, so we may want to sit with her or Georgette, perhaps to understand that better and kind of also define who would be the owner uh, going forward, and maybe that's a task. Uh, then we pass on to the chair. I was just <laughs> definitely thinking you were not going to say that. <laughs> I think that actually Georgette um, currently can edit and update our pages. Um, I don't think, she hasn't shied away from the help. I, I have an ownership of the website sort of to learn what we're replacing and how the tools work behind the scenes, so that's what got me in it. But um, many <coughs> department heads and content leaders own their own content, so it's a conversation we can have about whether we want to have one of us kind of help out with Georgette so there are two people who can update our content on our own page. So so that's another one. The third one, I think I provided a little update on the tech front. Um, uh, the tech innovation director, um, Eric Erickson, he reached out and uh, they've been looking to create a speaker series and this one is to the needs of advanced learners. And he has been in touch with Dr. Renzuli, who's a well-known uh, person in this area. He is associated um, with the University of Connecticut and has be, has worked in this area and differentiation in particular for a long time. So they're looking to tap into him and, and a few others. Um, so I am excited about that. And, uh, you know, he uh, I reached out to Dr. Kavanaugh if there is a possibility if we could host it here. Usually text uh, speaker series happen in tech in Walpole. And my hope was, you know, just in terms of awareness of some of the issues that 
these learners um, have, which very well are always said, you know, they'll be fine. So I felt like this would be an opportunity for a lot more people to get awareness. And I was hoping if we did it in our district, perhaps Holliston and Framingham, which are also members of tech, uh, this would be a possibility. And Dr. Kavno uh, very graciously um, agreed for a possibility to host it here. So. Uh, hopefully the stars will align. It's I don't think it's easy to get dates, uh, you know, just the panelists and whatnot. So Eric is working through that. Um, so that's what I have for updates. That's great. Uh, so if that's it for updates from liaisons, I think we should move ahead into the um, high school club stipend positions. Okay. So I am presenting that on behalf of Mr. Bishop. Uh, he has uh, six new clubs that he would like to um, establish at the high school. The National Art Honor Society, Habitat for Humanity, the Happy Hillers Club, Creative Writing, Magic the Gathering, and VSC. Um, those stipends are in the amount of $500 each. They will not cost the district any additional money because he's simply reallocating. So he's going to take clubs that are not running this year and just take the $500 stipends that would have been given to those advisors and move them over to these um, other clubs. Great. I, I'm always excited to see what all goes on in this high school. It always it makes me want to be a student here. It's amazing, all the clubs that are being offered here. Especially so. the magic, the gathering in club. <laughs> Whatever that means. Um, I, it, it, it's a student initiative. I mean, that that's these clubs come organically from students' ideas. It's really it's a, a great name. Yeah. Yeah. The it's ambiguity is delicious. Yeah. <laughs> so it, uh, is there a motion to, or questions, or do we have a motion? I move to approve this. Second? Second. Motion by Meg, second by Mina. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes, so it approves, and uh, then we move into our budget transfer request. Thank you. The, so the budget transfer request really is a follow-on to what you saw in the financial report. So all the over-unders, if you will, um, that's, this is the correction <laughs> of the over-unders. <laughs> what is an over-under? Over budget, under budget. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay. So. <laughs> Over the river and through the woods, yeah. And is, do we any have a questions? motion? Any questions? Yes, thank you. Questions? Is there a motion absent questions? I'll make a motion to approve this. Second? Second. Motion by Meg, second by Mina. All those in favor? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, and that also carries. So that moves us into the 10-year capital plan. Thank you again. So the 10-year capital plan, um, the focus for this committee really is for fiscal year 20. Um, our charge is to create a 10-year capital plan to j just kind of project out what else is on the horizon. Um, it's to keep awareness of our, our enrollment, our challenges in our building, and also just the, the mechanicals, if you will. So if anything that we don't address in the mechanicals this year will then just roll into the following year. Um, so the focus for the committee really is fiscal year 20, but it is to have that, have that vision, um, which is what the 10 year plan is for. Um, so briefly, just to go down through again, um, the building and grounds equipment for fiscal year 20 that includes two floor machines, uh, a line painter uh, for the fields, a couple of um, vacuum cleaners, and putting in irrigation in field 14, which is the Hopkins field. That's the only field that we actually do not have irrigation. So to use that as a real um, field for our athletic uh, teams, you really do need water. Um, because once they play on it a couple of times, the grass goes away. Um, okay. So that's your FY20 for that one. The HVAC district-wide, that's um, the return, re a lot of return fans, a couple of hot water pumps, um, and some exhaust fans. As you can see, as we go out and further years is when we start to get to some of those larger units. So for next year, we're looking to, you know, just somewhat start smaller. Um, there's never a guarantee that one of those larger units won't fail in the meanwhile. Um, so that 45 is kind of a placeholder for next year. 
Sorry, Susan, can, can I um, back you up to the first line? I'm just for one quick question on the mm -hmm. buildings and grounds. I know with the new turf field, we have a collaborative maintenance agreement, as, a, as under, I understood, with the town. Yes. Do we share equipment like line painters for other fields or in any other of our other equipment, or are we only sharing maintenance for the turf? We're sharing just, just for the turf. Just the turf. Yeah. So there's, we have, could we explore the idea of sharing? Line painters and, or so is that not something so that we do? So the line painter is is what you use to put the paint on the grass. Right. Um, so if somebody has a already has a turf field, um, for instance, Fruit Street. Yeah. They're not using line painters. Well, they have grass too. They also and there's grass like there are little pocket grass fields around town that get painted. Right. You know, with lines. So I didn't know. So if, the amount of painting we are painting those fields almost every single day because they're painted not only for games but also for practice. Okay. Yeah. So our line painter is in use okay. all day long. Thank you. Just thought I'd ask. Yeah. I mean it's it's always a good conversation to make sure if we can share equipment that we will. Yeah. This one particular piece, no. it, it's almost impossible. Okay. Thanks. And I'm sure Fruit Street is probably as busy with theirs as well. Probably. Um, so moving down to boiler replacements, as you can see, as you look out over the years, um, we have two middle school boilers and we have five high school boilers. So this is looking at those, kind of picking at them one at a time throughout the years. Um, flooring, that is a perpetual um, replacement plan. You'll always have tile, uh, you'll always have carpet that will need to be done throughout all the buildings. The roof replacements, this looks a little different than it did when I presented it the first time. Um, what we have done is we've broken out the first year for FY20 is really the design and engineering, and then if 21 would be the actual replacement. We wouldn't be able to get that all done next summer in the time that it goes from town meeting, design engineering, and, and actually getting it done during the summer so that's why it, it's kind of a two-year can you remind me which building that is it is a part of Hopkins and a part of middle school uh, kitchen equipment again this is a, a look at all of our kitchen equipment throughout all five um, buildings looking at both the walk-in refrigerator the walk-in freezers the reach-ins the ovens so just kind of getting at all of that equipment over time Vehicle replacement, there's two vehicles in there. One is a multifunction vehicle for athletics that can take smaller teams, and the other one is a special education van. Um, the system-wide uh, security upgrades, that is the continuing replacement of your cameras throughout the um, buildings. And as you look further out, once we get to a full build-out of what we're comfortable with cameras, then it becomes a camera replacement plan. And that's where it, it comes down in cost. The technology upgrades for next year would be the data center, which is a shared data center with the town, and some additional wireless access points throughout the buildings. Then you get down into the school capacity study, which we did speak about at the last, um, mm -hmm. last presentation. The one that's new that looked down below is middle school renovation and design engineering. In having conversations with each of the buildings in terms of where can they find space, one of the things uh, in talking with the middle school is there are different spaces that could, if with some changes, could potentially open up and become more classrooms. Um, so that 25000 is really looking at various spaces throughout the middle school, spending the money on the design and what would we need to do to bring these to classrooms um, or are there smaller learning spaces, what, but what is that? And then you'll see in the following year is 100000 to potentially make some of that work. So, Mr. Rothman, just a quick question on that. So the 50000 um, is the capacity study overall, which I think we all felt is needed ASAP. Um, but this 25000 are these actual changes? So the 25000 would be looking just at the middle school. So, for instance, in the middle school, there is a room that's a lecture hall. It's an unused space because of the, it's almost a small auditorium setup. So what would we need to do to reconfigure that to make that an actual learning space? So that's, that's a real focus of taking a room 
and reconfiguring it. The capacity study will look at everything in all the schools and looking at our enrollment. Um, you know, okay, this school probably is going to need X number of classrooms next. This is actual design build. Okay, so two different things. Okay, and where would, um, you know, obviously uh, out of that, some um, recommendations will come, right, for the actual build? The capacity study or the, you know, the, the renovation the middle school? The middle school. Yes, you'll so, see in the next year. There's so about 100,000 earmarked for that. So you think that's what it would likely be about? That's the projection? Projection, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and again, when you get down into the, um, those building numbers, you'll see that we did put in a number for portable classrooms um, at Hopkins. So again, those are all very soft numbers in that long-term projection. <clears throat> it's just to kind of keep an eye on our enrollment and our buildings and our capacity. And if we continue with the enrollment project, um, trajectory that we had this year, something will need to be done. What exactly that is, we don't know. So again, th those are all very soft numbers that are just kind of put in place um, because most buildings will need to be touched in some way. Then you get down to the increase in the bus parking lot, which we spoke about a little bit last time. Again, that change in costs um, was due to the increase in the stormwater management. The retention pond that exists does not function to, if we did nothing, that retention pond does not function the way that it should. It's not up to the standard size, et cetera. Um, so in building this parking lot, we have to bring that up to the size that it needs to be. Um, and all of those things have, have costs. And again, looking at our costs, the actuals, the bids that came in during the summer were much higher than we had originally projected. Susan, could you just, I don't know if you can do this extemporaneously. I'm guessing you can, but if you can't, we can come back to it. But I just was gazing out at these soft numbers um, for that little clump of master plan traffic, mm -hmm. you know, kind of adding them up. It's about 5.6 million, I think, if I added correctly. Um, you know, over years, and they're soft numbers, but they're all sort of targeting traffic, movement of vehicles, parking vehicles, whatever. Could you remind me what the drivers are behind that piece? Well, the, the first is moving the bus and, and vehicle traffic, yeah. which is the big push to get the bus parking lot behind. Yeah. So you have one entrance for parent vehicles, student, staff, yeah. and another entrance for bus. So that separates that traffic. But then in addition, once you do that, we want we would need to, you know, potentially, and these are all things that we could have further discussions on. We could okay. do some, we could do pieces of, yeah. you know, we could do none. Um, but as we continue with growth and we continue with um, hiring of teachers and hi you know increase in staff, oh, cars, you, the the parking. So some of this is an increase in parking. It is a, a better traffic flow within the campus. Um, so there's there's a lot of different avenues. So while Hayden Row is working. Hiller Day, it still does not work. Right. Um, <laughs> as, ever, as everyone knows. Um, but there's just, you know, better ways that we can make the flow within campus yeah. um, improved while also increasing parking and, you know, getting students and staff and parents to and from buildings with a easier access. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was also wondering if there is any way to track the date of request of all of these items. And, you know, some of the narrative that you have shared with us, is there any way that that could be documented um, so that we all know what we are talking about, even if it's a little blurb, right? Um, I don't know if that's a possibility. I'm not sure I follow. Uh, what I'm saying is that all of these requests that are out here, right, so the school capacity study, mm -hmm. right, um, I think I didn't hear of it last year. No, so, that's correct. Right, so that's brand new. Mm -hmm. So many times what happens is that we push 
some items because we have not been able to do it. Mm -hmm. But then we go back and we say, this has been sitting here for a while. Mm -hmm. So I think if we put in the date of request of a particular item, we can actually figure out how long it's been sitting there and how long we have pushed off some of these things. Because many times, you know, people forget. Right. The history is lost and it's like, oh, and we talked about it, right? And we decided to shift it from here to here. Right. So, so I this, think... So that's correct. Um, so this 10-year plan looks very different than a 10-year plan you've had before. Right. So going forward, um, so next year when we bring the 10-year plan, if something gets bumped along, absolutely it should be tracked mm -hmm. that it was requested unfunded. Right. And I would really like to see the date on it, uh, you know, whether, when I say date, it need not be 1st September, but maybe it's October 2018 or whenever that request comes in, because to me, this is almost like a living document or yes. living track sheet, mm -hmm. right? So that was one request. And the second is to kind of some of the things that you have explained, right? Um, that verbiage, it would be very, very helpful to even those one or two lines if it could be attached a, as an item. I think we do that with most of the budget items that are presented by the principals and whatnot. You know, they add a few things, what's included in, in these items. I think that'll be very helpful um, from a tracking perspective. Um, the third request I have is, you know, I, I think Amanda brought up a very good point about um, that the traffic pattern, that seems like one group, right? So when, when I look at this, I, I really like that you have it both, um, you know, horizontic, horizontally and vertically tracking the 10 year total, right? You have it on the rightmost column. Yep. So it's speaking to building and grounds equipment, what is it adding up to um, at that level, but also within the year mm -hmm. for FY20, what, what it's looking like. I, I would really appreciate if we could probably have some more subgroups if you see, for instance, the traffic plan or anything related to the buildings, you know, the capacity increase, right? If you can think of there, if there are any ways that you see of them being glummed, that might be another sub item to intuitively tell people that, you know, this is what it adds up to, to look at. I like that idea. I was trying to do that myself and I was like, yeah, I like that idea. Yeah, so if you can think of those, that will be very helpful. Mm -hmm. I know you have a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, are we, uh, so we're making a motion to approve the 10-year plan, but the, all of which I know is important, but the piece for FY20 is actually advancing to the next stage of so it, so everything does. Okay. Yeah. So we are required to submit a 10-year capital plan, um, but though year one is is what would go to town meeting. That, that's what I mean. That year that's two through ten comes as comes back. Okay. The only other question I had um, in general that I did I didn't see an item for this, so I, I don't know if it's a reasonable item or not, but I know the high school is currently going through re-accreditation, the NEASC. Yes. Um, would there be any likelihood of something emerging from that, like our science facilities aren't really up to snuff, or we need, you know, some, something sort of facilities capital related that might emerge from that? I don't know, I've never seen the output of that kind of a process, so maybe you could... I have actually seen um, an ES report where the building becomes an issue, but typically that's when you have an old and unmaintained building. Okay. I wouldn't imagine that that would happen okay. in this building sure, that is fairly new. Wood and wood anyway. Yes, let's knock on wood anyway. <laughs> well, you never know. I wasn't sure, you know, yeah. what they, I've, I've never actually done any work in the science labs. I don't, they look okay to me, but my basis is 1986, <laughs> you know, when I graduated <laughs> high school, so. <laughs> so. Okay, good. So, if there are no other questions, I would seek a motion to approve the 10 year capital plan as outlined here. So moved. I'm sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. Motion. Do you have a question or are you no. just moving it? I was just moving it. You second. Second. I second. Second by Meg. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So that passes. Thank you very much. This has been a very heavy meeting with information <laughs> that you've had to provide. Uh, so the next item is the proposal for the school community resource bridge. And I just wanted to give it a little bit of context before we discuss it. 
uh, I was approached by Don Ronan of the Youth Commission to, with the idea generally for something of this nature. And the conversation really evolved out of an awareness uh, of some of the needs that students have that are currently not being, the kids that are coming to school that don't have the supplies or the means to provide the supplies. Students that are arriving that don't have snacks, for example. Uh, and there are different organizations currently that are able to fill gaps here and there, but the many of the community organizations will not meet the needs in the school, which is understandable because they're uh, their mission is community driven, not in the school. So the idea here was to look at what's going on at the school from sort of a larger, not, not down to see you know what particular mm -hmm. kids need, but to see what is needed to make sure that our kids <coughs> are able to come to be at school and to be ready to learn for one. And also so that it is not impacting, uh, I, my understanding is that in some cases there have been individual staff members who have provided things, out of their own goodness of their hearts have provided notebooks and things for kids that didn't have given the difficulties that we have with our budget we can't provide all the needs for all the kids all the time but i do think that um, we have the means to be a vehicle for people to come together which was where i came up with the bridge name i wasn't trying to steal it from other areas it wasn't your idea <laughs> the bridge piece was oh, the, the, the entire idea was not um, but to look, to be aware that our community has shifted um, socioeconomically and that we want kids to be able to learn to have a level playing field so that they're not coming and being hungry, they're not coming and they don't have pencils or what they need, uh, and to bring other community partners in who might be able to fill it. Uh, the HPTA has stepped up for many things, but they obviously have their own limits of what they're doing. Um, but they still do have a reach into the community of, of, because their organization is so large that they might be helpful to have on the community in the event, not just that they're able to fill a particular need, but that they ha have so many connections in the community. That each building would have some representation based on the administrator's best judgment of who would be able to fill that need. Uh, in some cases, um, it could be a teacher that wants, that's interested in being involved but not wanting to burden teachers and administrators who already have large loads, so looking for people who are really interested in partnering and being part of this mission. So that's, I think, where it is. I, I, any questions if people want to that's ask a great idea. I, I think, I, first of all, I love the name The Bridge. <laughs> Right. It's. Um, I, I think it just conveys what it what it is that you're looking for in such a beautiful manner without seeming, um, you know, exclusive in any way. It, it seems so inclusive. Um, I'm. I'm just wondering. You know, um, with all that we have been talking about, absolutely. I think this is something we should look at. I'm wondering what is the appetite of the members who you, you know have stepped up to go beyond the uh, socioeconomic diversity to broaden this, right? Uh, and, you know, I'm thinking about what Timoria talked about earlier, about the community communication group. And having started that um, subcommittee, I feel like there was obviously a disconnect on how it was perceived when it was set up and how uh, Timoria's experience was um, because to me, it was a separate thing that I'd asked for when we came on board. But clearly, there was some mix-up that happened. But when I think about it, I think there was an opportunity lost there, right, to, to probably, uh, you know, talk about all these other points and uh, perhaps make it a bit broader. And I'm just wondering, when you're creating the bridge, um, is there a possibility to make it broader? And you know, if you're focused on this, and what about all these other areas where also kids are disadvantaged, right? Because they're either not feeling safe or what have you. So is there any thought on widening the bridge uh, and making it a bit broader? So I like the con conceptually the idea of meeting all of those needs, but I, I feel like this is really specific to concrete economic needs and that I would like to see another kind of 
effort directed at meeting that that I guess I see this more meeting specific resources and kind of meeting not not resources of the schools but resources of the community that can provide things that are concrete not looking at um, I'm not I'm failing myself on words at this hour but the looking at it for example you know a teacher could bring a request forward that they're seeing kids that don't have mittens schools hold mitten drives that go to other community organizations but they could also do something to collect mittens for and I'm not saying this is something that's definitely gonna be done but as an example collecting a group could come in and collect mittens for students at different schools specific to being in the school oh you know little Johnny or whoever doesn't have mittens the teacher notices and is able to match them with a resource on the ground I guess is more my so uh, the way I understood it is that it's more the implementation but more the long term and, and that's where I felt that this is probably an opportunity um, and so that that's my thought on this um, the other request I have I think as we go forward with forming um, subcommittees or any mm -hmm. work um, to be as inclusive as possible mm -hmm. I, I think I don't need to tell you that. You're, you're very good with that. Um, I think it would be helpful to be mindful of, of that. All the voices which have been here and who yeah. feel the change impacting them, right, as well as the new members in the community who are not as connected. So how do we make sure that we find every opportunity to bring all those voices into the conversation? So those are the two thoughts I have in my mind. Uh, I don't know what others think. What, I wonder if you've done any research into, say, what Framingham does for their low-income students? So but There must be a paradigm out there that's... I, I think that would be part of what the group would be looking at, is what exists currently, where the needs are, potentially looking in other districts to see how they're meeting them and finding where we can match to resources that we have here. And you want to be on this? I, I do. I was actually very enthusiastic when Dawn, and I know that Dawn also yep. wants to do that on behalf of the Youth Commission. She also has the advantage of being obviously a member of the HDCA and can bring in some other um, knowledge with that. But I, I think inclusion is a great thing. And if there are other people that, this is just sort of a, a brief pass at who Dawn and I had thought we want to make sure to in include this group without it being overwhelmingly big so we can go in and, and move forward oh, sure. but also not wanting to exclude anybody who would want to have a seat at the table to discuss this that it's not would not I think it would be easy to come back to say we'd like to add you know X number of people to the group so that would be a separate motion would be that I would in fact like to to work on this but I beyond who does it I would like to see if we could get a consensus on whether or not we can do this because the school committee will this group will report to the school committee this group is not not part of the youth commission although it will have liaisons from the youth commission but will be sort of like housed by the school committee so to speak like some of our other subcommittees are It'll be a subcommittee, so it'll be uh, un, under the open meeting law restrictions it will, and it, so forth. It yeah. will be okay. subject to all the open meeting laws, posting and otherwise, and um, everyone will have to be sworn in. But I think, I actually think that that is an important piece so that people see the visibility. Part of what I hope the group will do will raise the visibility of this issue that the federal poverty guidelines are so difficult. It, it, People have so much more money than that that still struggle. Yeah, that it's, and it's hard to meet the needs beyond that if we don't have a mechanism for it. And will you include some CPAC people in this? Because Absolutely. special ed parents tend to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars a year on treatments and supports. It's and yeah. a good idea, Nancy. Not my idea originally, but I, I was enthusiastic about it. Good. Way to put it into action. I move to recommend, what does it say? To approve the charter for the bridge subcommittee of the school committee. Is there a second? Oh. Are you okay? You, you can have a discussion. Do you want to? 
I, I think Mina had a, had oh, a suggestion yes. so, on the table about broadening the scope. Are we? I, and I think it's a great, I mean, I feel like we have to start somewhere. And if we, I think this is such an important thing in our community, especially in our community. And I feel like we should just get the ball rolling. And if we need to um, have future discussions to make sure that we, you know, we can add things to it later if we need to, but to get the ball rolling now and make sure it happens for this year especially with winter coming? You know, I, I, I completely understand what you're saying, and I do think this is a great idea. I think it's important to be done, but I feel all too often we have been brushing it aside and putting it aside. I, I think it's time. I think this is a beautiful initiative. I don't want to force it on people, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, but I think we have been talking about diversity for a while and it's a beautiful name I just want you all to think about and you have just the right mix of people even to start off and maybe this is the first thing you do and maybe you work on other things and you know Dr. Cavanaugh has this thing already ready um, you know so creating that bridge working with her and taking this forward I would love to see this a little bit broader really um, if you can think of that I think you know that will be fantastic so I, am, I guess I'm uncomfortable adding it in now because I don't want right. to, I would rather, rather than add it in now, I would rather come back with a second proposal. I, I think that both work is really important, but I think that in this case, they're a little bit separate to start in that it might be something that the charter could be amended to add in later on if we see that, that the diversity work should fall under that umbrella. I'm just not sure that it falls under just this umbrella. I think it is broader than just the economic piece. Oh, I, I completely agree with you. I, I do think it's it's broader than this. And my hope would be that, you know, I think I've stated this, uh, that if you can all think of that, are you willing to broaden it, but start off with this piece of work? And, you know, you, you can probably map it out. I, I don't want us to have this not a vision of doing something when there is, you know, it's right there, you know, the, the elephant in the room. I will say this is, I think, one of the first things I've ever heard of that is primarily focused on the socioeconomic gaps, which is completely a new phenomenon in our town. For the, you know, it's, it's been there, but not to the same degree as it is now. There are um, other groups that, I mean, as we've heard, that are talking about other parts, but I was kind of, it was re sort of refreshing for me to hear of a focused group raising awareness on this particular dimension, because I haven't really heard that much spoken about it, but would you be comfortable voting tonight? Are you? Um, like I said, I do think this is needed. Uh, so if, if everyone feels that, uh, you know, we move forward with this right now and then we'll come back maybe next time we meet with another proposal for the other aspects of diversity and inclusion, then I'm absolutely fine with it. Sure. I, I think what Mina is saying here too, and I don't mean to put words in your mouth, love, but we asked several times for a subcommittee on diversity and equity, and it hasn't appeared yet. Because that could also be a subcommittee on diversity and it, equity, and these are the steps we're going to take, and these are the tools we're going to employ. It absolutely so, could. In I, addition. I, yes, in addition. And I do think I have not strayed from the importance of that work, but I also hear from the HDCA, for example, that that might not be we jumping in with that right that now might not be the best heard that too. so i am concerned with um where we're trying to maybe the i stole the bridge is the wrong name because we need bridges in so many areas yes. um, but trying to build a bridge there i think we want to be mindful and careful in how we in not taking a kind of top down from just the school committee and i it, to do that. I also think that if you have a particular charge that you would like to discuss um, and bring forward related to diversity, that that's something certainly that we could discuss um, putting on a future agenda as well. Because I do think it's important work, but I also think it's important to be done in collaboration with the work the district is already doing. I think we have to find a way to not just have silos of things here and there, but to have part of that 
but and also I've got to find a new word for bridge. No, but that's it. I, that, that's the whole problem. I, you came up with such a good word, and um, I'm thinking this is it. This is connection. the bridge. So if you want to call it bridge one, and you promise that we're <laughs> going to have bridge two, three, four. Maybe we'll have super bridge or something. <laughs> I, I don't know. but I, Because I do want to have a, a different bridge, I guess, yeah. for that. No, I, I agree so. with you, and I think this is absolutely worthy. I'm just still absorbed in the conversation that took place earlier and sorting through some of the mixed messages that, I, you know, we, we all kind of mishear and misread people all the time. And so we'll, we'll sort it out. Yeah, we do need bridges, Nancy. We need bridges. We will build bridges. And it, it, that conversation we had earlier really is a first step, I think, in moving a different bridge forward. But it is the name of a Danish crime drama about a serial killer, too. Oh, I am not sure I wanted to know that right this moment. Uh, on a practical note with the, yes. the bridge, I just want to mention that um, one of the first things that struck me when I read this was that there are a number of, as I know you know, high school service-oriented clubs. Many of them arm wrestle over right. who gets to do which service, and they often struggle because they have a commitment to service, whether it's Key Club, Community Service Club, National Honor Society, Student Council, they're all serving. And I love, love, love the idea of having at least one club focus on in-service within the town. And I think that they would be almost relieved to have a focus brought to them because they mm -hmm. struggle to figure out, you know, where can I send these mittens? Or who do, you right. know, and if we, ha they do fundraising, they sell concessions, they do, you know, they have sort of a steady stream of income, but they don't always know how to spend it. And it's not millions of dollars, no, but, but it would certainly buy snacks. It, so I think I, there might be an opportunity to connect students. So if you're looking at the makeup of the committee, um, like I love, I know there are two students who sit on like the Hop Coalition with Denise, and they do a nice job. And I love the idea of having maybe a student or two um, because they can then connect us with which service organizations might be well positioned. I would agree with that entirely. I like the idea of two because I think that when you're in high school and you're coming to a group of adults, it's nice to come with somebody. Yes, um, definitely. As much as I like to not be scary. So I will add two students onto this as an amendment, um, and we can do that after there's a motion. We can add a friendly amendment if somebody wants to. I, I, will, make, I will make a motion yep. to move forward. Um, with as presented. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Okay, so we can move on then um, to our next thing. And I will um, come back again so that with a separate motion to hopefully appoint, um, <laughs> you know. So I've, know. I've <laughs> somebody who's very invested in it. Okay, so I, I am up again here. So the turf field subcommittee, this is back to the subcommittee that already exists, not the one, not the committee that we discussed going through the town at the last meeting. And the reason the turf field subcommittee still exists, even though the turf field is built, is there's still obviously some lingering things that are not done being completed, but the uh, turf field subcommittee and the school committee made a commitment to the town that we would fundraise to offset the cost of the debt um, that the town was taking on. So the um, Jean Birchman, who used to be the turf field um, subcommittee liaison, has been continuing to provide some insight on grants. She has experience as a grant writer. We have one available community spot left um, and would like to add her back on so she can continue to grant and, and write grants and help fundraise with with and on behalf of the committee. So. I think Jean has just done an amazing job for years and given so much to the community. So I, I support, you know, letting her be involved in this, but I'm just curious um, if, uh, if was this vacancy open to other people? Was it advertised? It has been the, it, somebody stepped off. It has been open for a while. Uh, it, it, so to answer your question, no, it was the athletic director had requested because she has the contacts in terms of the having worked with, um, now I'm blanking on the two grants that she had been working on. Price Chopper, I believe, was one. Price Chopper was definitely one. And Middlesex Bank, maybe? Or Ooh, no, it's a was bank. It, no, it was a, a bank that she had specifically one tracked one. down just as a volunteer. Okay. I just thought that, you know, if we're looking for a community at large member, 
don't we have to advertise it to the community to see who else wants involvement? We do not. Uh, we have the authority as the committee itself to appoint anybody, really. Sometimes we do advertise at the beginning, but this is a time-limited thing that it, this committee is going to disband shortly, and she has a lot of history to know where we're jumping in. Is Ms. Bushman uh, willing to take this on? She is. <laughs> okay. she, she has been doing things unofficially to, as okay. a volunteer. That's great. So, yeah. And it's a small group of people who have been working on the fundraising, to be honest. It's not it, it, her commitment to helping the schools meet this commitment is... Right. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, I understand where you're coming from, Meg, you know, yeah. in general from a, yeah. from yeah. a standard practice perspective to open it, but, but obviously we all know how close this is to Ms. Bushman. Um, this project, she worked very, very hard to bring this to fruition with all the other volunteers and administrators, and if she is willing to work on the fundraiser, if, uh, you know, in the fundraising part, and I know it's a big goal, out there, and I, I think she's very tenacious, and I think um, she she would work very, very hard to do. I have no doubt. I would also say if there are others in the community who are interested in helping with fundraising, that there would definitely... They will, they will get turned away. <laughs> they will not be turned away. Well, I make a motion to approve Jean Birchman to the Turfield Subcommittee. Is there a second on that? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, so that moves us to the Hopkins School gift account. Okay, this one should be very easy. Um, the Hopkins School, not unlike other schools in the district, do the you know Art One or Art Zonia, whichever company they're using, um, as a fundraiser. And Hopkins has earned nine hundred and fourteen dollars and seven cents. We are just looking for your approval to put it in their gift account. So is there? Is there a second? Second. So motion by Meg, second by Mina. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And so that. So carries, and that moves us uh, down into some policy, and that is you again. Yes, it is. Okay. So the policy that we are looking at first is GBEBD. It is the online fundraising and solicitation um, crowdfunding um, policy. We have not had this policy in the past. Um, so what we've really done is we've sort of just uh, taken this from the MASC and. Um, I think that there are a couple of things, the way that um, MASC has this written, that maybe I'll just talk about first, and then you know you can obviously deliberate about it. Um, so in that second paragraph, uh, where it says, the principal of each school shall approve all online fundraising activities within their buildings prior to any employee posting any such fundraising solicitation. I think that this is important for us. We have had teachers in the past just, you know, sort of do that crowdfunding thing. Um, and it's really lovely that they have people all over the place who are making donations to us, but sometimes that will set up inequities, like one classroom will have something that another classroom does not have. Um, when we get further down, uh, the solicitation can say, so two paragraphs down at the end, classroom X needs tissues and crayons, but it shouldn't be directed to parents, guardians who have shared email addresses with the teacher for purposes of communicating about their student. Um, there are times when we reach out to parents for things like post-it notes and tissues and those kinds of things, so we may want to think about that language right there. Um, in the next paragraph, employees using crowdfunding services shall periodically disclose in, writing, disclose in writing to the superintendent the names of all individuals whom the employee has directly solicited. Um, I kind of like that because that would allow us to use things like Sign Up Genius in order to get you know, rubber bands for a science project, but it wouldn't allow teachers to just sort of put it out there publicly because we'd have no idea the names of the people who had been solicited, um, and those would have to be available for public records request. Um, and then the last part of this, a couple things, at the very bottom of that page, items or proceeds directly sent to employees are considered gifts to the employee and may result in violation of state ethics laws. So a few years ago when we created the form that goes with policy KCD-1, uh, we had decided that anything above $50 would become the property of the Hopkinton Public Schools. Anything under $50 could be the property of the teacher because teachers are not allowed to accept gifts in excess of $50. Um, and then the same is true if we look at the very last paragraph. 
unless otherwise approved the superintendent in writing um, by the superintendent in writing all goods and or proceeds solicited and received through any online solicitation shall become the property of the school committee and not of the in individual employee so um, that just speaks to that fifty dollars above and fifty dollars below so there we go Any questions so um Dr. Kavna, I don't know if you recall, there was something similar that came up when Dr. McLeod was here. And she had actually refrained and tried to restrict some of this, as I recall, saying that, you know, we need to first look at what funds we have, if this is causing some issues, et cetera. Um, so can you speak a little bit to that context and what happened then and why this changed now and in what context, if you don't mind? Yes, so I'm hoping that that's what this policy is going to help to do, is to keep people from doing just what we had a problem with last time. So I think we had a teacher who had um, put something out for, I mean, like, on sort of a national, international level saying, I'm a new teacher and I need a classroom library. Veteran teachers very typically will have books and books and books. Um, new teachers won't have those. And so people were making all kinds of contributions to that. And it was really lovely that a new teacher was getting a pretty extensive library. Uh, but I think our fear was that, did it send a message to the public that we couldn't afford books for teachers? Um, did it set up an inequity with other teachers who had lesser of a library? Um, and then we got into conversations about how, uh, well, who would those things belong to? Would they belong to the Hopkinton Public Schools or would they belong to the individual teacher? Um, and then issues of, you know, is it fire retardant or is it not fire retardant? Does it meet particular codes? Where would we store those things during the summer? Um, and then we also had some special education inequities. So, for example, if a teacher decided that she wanted to get a particular set of chairs where kids could sit up higher and sort of swing their legs because that kind of movement sort of helped them stay uh, attentive to the learning in the classroom, if the classroom next door didn't have that, would we then have, you know, the inequity? So we talked about all of those things when we were looking at KCD and KCD1. So those are separate policies? They are. Yeah. Okay. Um, we should probably add them as cross-references in here. No, I think we should I definitely use, add them yeah, as cross-references. Yes. So one's a form, right, and one's a policy? Yes, KCD is the policy. Form, yeah. KCD1 so, is the form. Would you know the name of uh, that policy by any chance? I do. It's gifts to the schools or to the school district. I think this, when we talk about online fundraising and solicitation, is sort of one way to acquire those gifts. Okay. So that is what makes this just a little bit different. Yeah, it was revised November 2nd, 2017. Sounds like I remember that well. <laughs> okay. Any other... Um, comments and we did not receive any uh, feedback on the policy mm -hmm. so this being a first reading although it is an MASC policy uh, I don't know if people want to make a motion on that or if you want to bring it back and I'm looking to you guys because you're the policy. I was just going to ask you, Dr. Cavanaugh, did, you, were, you mentioned in a particular section, I'm sorry, I can't remember where it was, about we wanted to be cautious about the wording of it. Are you comfortable with the wording the way it is, or do you think we need to work on it? Uh, I think one thing that I am a little bit cautious about, the principal of each school shall approve all online fundraising activity within the buildings prior to any employee posting any such fundraising solicitation. I am almost of the mindset that we shouldn't be doing any online sort of solicitation, at least classroom teachers. Now, there may be times when, you know, students will want to do some kind of solicitation for funds, and, and it might be appropriate to do it online, but I don't necessarily. Well, I guess if a teacher wanted to do, do something like sign up Genius to get Post-it notes, I think mm -hmm. I would be okay with that. So I don't know if we want to think about think more about, and maybe that's something for the policy subcommittee to think about maybe defining better what we mean by online solicitation. You know, I think so, things like consumables, like post-it notes are fine, but things that, you know, I think are just exceedingly expensive, like chairs, furniture, or books, or those kinds of things might not be appropriate. Okay. So 
So should we work I, on the wording of that yeah, and then bring so. this back for a second reading? Does so, that make yeah. sense? Yeah, I, yeah. I, have, I have actually a question. So, does, so the policy uh, subcommittee is primarily the three of you, mm -hmm. is that right? Are there any teachers or students engaged in this conversation? Because it does involve them too, right? And I know that it's not easy because you're looking at a broad spectrum of um, things. So just wondering, I know we send this out and seek uh, you know, feedback. Well, Dr. Kavanaugh has taken, um, I forget how much policy went back to the, about the um, student accounts, I think, mm -hmm. and took that back to the students. students. And I think when we talked about the AEDs, that went back to the um, safety team. And okay. So okay. I think Dr. Kavanaugh is sort of the liaison, is, is usually. The with that. That. Okay. But I don't know that this has gone, has this, I don't think this has gone specifically beyond the, the broad distribution. Like, No, it has not gone yeah. beyond the broad distribution. And I think, too, that um, when we have the policy about the dissemination of policies, <laughs> it does say that we have to give people who would be affected by the policy a heads up. So I'm happy to share this one with the building principals so that they can share it out with their faculties. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other feedback before we send that back to policy? No, I think there was a, just that cross-reference that you talked about, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking at the other um, item out there, um, you know, that particular policy that may be worth looking at as well. Right. Which one? KCD. Uh, KCD. KCD. Okay. Do you want us to bring that one back as a reference when we come back with this one, so you can see it? But, yeah, sure. If you're able to, but I I just looked at it just now. Okay. Benefit of everybody. But this is great. You know, this is keeping up with the times, and this is fantastic. All right. We'll work on it. So know. You are a very hip subcommittee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that we're uh, working group just saying. Yes, we're working group. down to JJE, I believe. Okay. So JJE is the student fundraising activity uh, policy. Um, this is an MASC policy as well. Uh, it's brand spanking new to us. Um, it pretty much just says that if students are selling tickets to athletic events, drama, musical performances, all of that is fine. Students are able to do the kind of charitable fundraising. And um, interestingly, it does say that the proposals have to be submitted to and approved by both the building principal and the superintendent. This is not a current practice that we have. Do you want that to be a current practice? I think I, I would be perfectly comfortable if the principals were responsible for this. I mean, I think that it becomes redundant right. for me to look at them, too. Exactly. Right, I agree. I kind of, yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's only for other fundraising activities, not for the ones that are listed in here, athletic events and... I think also charitable. Probably. I think that was for charitable, yeah. Ah, okay. Got it. Yes. The next one down, other fundraising activities that wish to involve students in the fundraising process shall be submitted to the superintendent for approval. I'm imagining that those are things like, you know, we're taking a field trip and, you know, we want to raise funds for that field trip or, you know, we'd like to have our prom in Disney World this year, so, so we're going to raise funds for that, right? Um, do you want to see that or do you want the principal to see that? Again, I think that I would be comfortable with the principal seeing that. I think, I think that yeah. they have a much better handle on what kind of fundraising happens in their buildings. All right, so do you want to bring this one back Surely. as well then? Yep. Any other comment on that? All right, that brings us then to the uh, ethics policy. Oh, could we also put in principal in the last paragraph? Sure. I'm sorry. No, nope, that's fine. The specific is that of the principal? Yeah. Yep. So that's, I would imagine, like they're just walking around with a bucket at lunch collecting money for like Hurricane Michael or something, right? I think the principal oh, right, could decide that as well. <laughs> Your inbox is probably going to be getting full otherwise. Yes. All right, so we know what we're doing with those. Um, moving on to old business. You will be relieved to see that BCA is very easy. We looked at that one last time we were together, and the only thing that has changed uh, are the four words in red font on number six, which we had discussed last time. Yeah, the removal of the playing politics. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Since we all had different visions of mm -hmm. playing politics. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I guess you uh, you know I'm sorry to be a little picky here could we leave it num point number six as accept the office as a committee member as a means of service with no intent to pursue a personal agenda Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, take out the word unselfish. Yes, please. If you don't mind. I don't. Do you mind? Yeah, and if, if we can approve it as, as uh, with that amendment. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think we can do that. All right. Anything else, or, or is there a motion? I move to approve. As amended. As amended. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So moves, uh, and so that brings us to BGE. Okay, um, BGE, as I recall, so we had a first reading on October 4th, and I think at that time we had that conversation about um, how the policies would be disseminated. The policy itself says that um, we would extend it to all the employees of the school district and, you know, make it accessible to everyone in the community, but we had conversations about whether or not social media would be a vehicle for dissemination. And what were your thoughts when you met Oliver again on that topic? And, you know, when you say in so far as conveniently possible um, mm -hmm. to all persons in the community, um, why did you think that that needs to be called out like that? And I don't know what has changed. Has anything changed, or is it back as is? I think it's back as is. I thought it's, that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Any uh, yeah. questions, comments? I think questions. the only thing that I would say, as a school district, it's easy for us to put things out through School Messenger. Right. I mean, we have our own Facebook page, right. but I don't necessarily know that we have as a school district access to other forms to push that out. Yeah, no, not know. other forms. Yeah. Whatever our, our school uh, accounts that we have, just mm -hmm. as a, and I know um, Jen had some thoughts on the social media part, and I know social media is like a word today, hot topic. Uh, but but I, I, I think that, you know, mm -hmm. since you're such a hip committee and you're keeping up with the times, <laughs> It, it would really, uh, you know, maybe something for just that aspect that um, I think even if it's not convenient, you know, we have to try and reach as many people as possible. I, I think that's something I would like to see pop out. Um, would you be comfortable if Georgette just put that on the, t the district's Facebook page additionally without sort of calling out Facebook? Specifically, yes, yes no, no, great Facebook, idea. and yeah. I think we talked about that, that we don't want to call out Facebook, Twitter, because right. they'll be gone, but perhaps, you know, whatever are the communication uh, methods that are in use in the district, using, maximizing them, mm -hmm. right, whether it is school messenger, whether it is that, um, sometimes I don't know if uh, a policy change has happened, if it can go part of the newsletters from uh, policy corner. Yeah, I the, the policy that, corner. The only thing that always gets me, and I am like totally old fashioned with communications, I think, but almost like the more channels there are, the more I feel like I miss things. I feel like yes. if we if we say that we have an official mechanism for, it'll always be here. We'll try to, we'll, you know, maybe we'll put it out a couple, couple of other places, but I, I personally like to know if I always go to the school committee page or, you know, whatever, if I always go there, that's where it is. If... Mm -hmm. Somebody says, oh, I saw it on Twitter, or I saw it here. Then I start to feel frantic because I'm not keeping up with all the places I should have seen something. But I don't know. That's just me. I'm not sure if more is always better. I agree. If we're clear about where we put things and how we communicate, mm -hmm. and maybe we pick one Facebook page or one Twitter channel or one Instagram or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But I almost want to just pick a set and make it our official mode of communication. I get worried about it, trying to keep up with too many. It makes me dizzy. I don't know. Yeah. Sure, I, I hear what you're saying. So, I, to me, for the policy sake, I would, I would like to be able to say this is the official way that we do it. But in practice, I really do actually like the idea if Georgia could throw it up on what now is Facebook, but in a couple of years may not be Facebook, but to allow people who are not. Uh, it also allows people who are not in our system yeah. that are you know, residents of the town that might have a vested interest in what we're doing with the tax money. Uh, but 
it, it allows it to be shared then if somebody sees, you know, yeah, the Hopkinton true. School. I, but I don't want to put that, I don't want to add that in the policy because no. I do agree with your yeah. point about there should, the official place should be one, but it's important to, to me to share mm -hmm. officially. Yeah, no, yeah, no I, I think that makes sense. I, I'm just wondering um, about this verbiage. I guess the spirit with which I'm looking at is um, I, I'm fa I've been fairly old-fashioned in, um, you know, in terms of uh, I, I refrained from social media for the longest time until last year, and uh, I have understood the power of it and the fact that there are so many people accessing it, and uh, where I almost had this, I, I, I don't know why people are on Facebook. I actually do understand why people do that, and I actually respect people more now who are actually using it for propagating ideas or communication and you look at kids that you know this is this is the generation who are uh, accessing information through these means and we have all those handles so I guess from a policy standpoint my hope would be that whatever is the channel that we utilize to communicate with the community mm -hmm. we should use all those channels yeah. Right, and if that includes social media, use it. If we don't use social media, then don't do it. Right, I'm not saying we create it, um, and uh, just the fact when when I see the uh, first line in the second paragraph, it speaks to um, accessibility is extended at least to all employees of the school districts to members of the committee. Right, so we seem to have absolute it seems like a preference and in so far as conveniently possible to all persons in the community. Um, I think the school community, you know, all the parents should be in the same, spoken in the same league as employees as well as members of the committee. Again, that's my opinion and I know you cover it to speak about um, that groups who are impacted, you would reach out to them. So for instance, if there is a policy that impacts, say CPAC, you, you would reach out, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but I, I just am thinking if we could broaden this up a little bit. Um, I, I don't know. Can I just say something against social media and spreading the policy? Because, you know, we go to the school website to find official documentation that is authored by people who've been hired by the district and we trust. You don't go to Facebook for that. Because Facebook is the source of so much misinformation. I mean, you risk kind of ruining the reputation of the school by putting your policies out there. I don't think I'm saying we're putting policies there. I'm saying that, let's say you're making a change. And I, you know, correct me if I'm misunderstanding this. To me, you're bringing about a change um, so, for instance, the crowdfunding, yeah. right? How are we going to disseminate the information that we are coming up with this policy, we are looking at it, do you have any feedback? That's what we are soliciting. But, but I think we make it too easy. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, no. but I'm so tired, Mina. I'm okay. just going to interrupt at this point. <laughs> I, think, I think we have to let people do a little bit of work. Don't spoon feed everything to the community. If they want to look for something, they can go on the website and look. They will go to the website for the policy ultimately, but I'm saying that there's a change coming up, right? I think that's what we're talking about here. What gets sent out as listserv, we have these Twitter handles which talk about all these things that are happening uh, with the high school or what have you. So again, I'm not saying that uh, you, know, you have to do it. I'm just saying broaden the scope. If that is a means of communication which people have signed up for, what is wrong with utilizing that forum to say we're bringing about a change? I'm not saying we post policies there. I see. It, I, I agree I, with not yeah. posting them there. No, I, yeah. no. I the, the home for it is the website. Yeah. Sorry, uh, uh, sorry, Meg. I know you're tired. Yeah. I'm so I'm usually in bed by now. <laughs> Hang on, we're getting close. All right. Uh, do we want to table this to a third reading, <laughs> or do we want to plow through it? Whatever you want, Chair. How would we change it? What is what is the the options for changing it? To, if we bring it back. So I my my preference, and I'm only one of us, so that would I, I would look to somebody who does want to change it. My preference would be to pass it as it is, 
and if we want to put the, as Mina said, the to say on because we do have a Facebook page that the district puts some announcements on, to say this policy and this policy are being reviewed, direct them to the website for where their policies actually can be found. I'm fine with that in practice. I don't have any need to have it in the policy, but I. I could propose a, a short little amendment to address your, if you want to say. I mean, if we if we go to that accessibility is, is to extend at least to blah blah blah, um, conveniently as possible to all persons in the community, using whatever communication tools are currently used by the district or something, and that I, I, would kind of include perfect. encompass yeah. the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So however we normally communicate, if it's today or 30 years from now, we use all of our channels that we normally communicate with. So would you like to read a motion um, with that included on it? I would like to make a motion to accept this with the following amendment, to amend the second paragraph to say, accessibility is to extend at least to all employees of the school district, to members of the committee, and insofar as conveniently possible, to all persons in the community using whatever communication tools using using a, using the standard communication tools of the district using it would that work yes tidy and the standard a, communication tools of the district and is there a second for that motion second and all those in favor aye, aye. okay aye. and so that passes <laughs> and that brings us up if anybody has anything very briefly they wanted to throw out there as a future agenda item to be considered. Otherwise, we will move into, um, I better look just to make sure I'm not passing over something item. Oh, public comment, which uh, unless we have people hiding back there, I think we're all set with. Uh, I have something on ahead. future agenda. Yes, I, okay. I, I think, <laughs> although this is lengthening the conversation, but Meg might actually like it. Okay. Um, just here now, when, when, we, uh, when we come up with the agenda, I think there is a time that we schedule, right? And many times as part of the discussion, the conversation is longer, like we had the situation today. And I think it's important to have those conversations and not curtail it just because we're running out of time. Some of it is anticipated, some of it is unanticipated. I think it was unanticipated today. Um, so. But as time progresses, um, Meg and me and uh, perhaps others too are getting tired and we want to plow through stuff, mm -hmm. right? So can, and, and I don't even know, you know, the administrators are probably here from eight in the morning. They're so well then, right? <laughs> we're 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 um, so I, I would like us to discuss at our next meeting that whatever is the closure time, we close it. And yes. then whatever remains, we bring yes. it back. If we have decided that nine o'clock is the time that we are ending it, we end it at nine, so that the conversation is meaningful. It's not about sleep or whatever, but we have to have valid inputs. And you cannot do it when you are super tired. Although, you know. Uh, well, okay, so I put that, that is on the is kind of fun. I have put that on my list here, and uh, I think we can bring that for the November 1 meeting I, to have a conversation on how we want to proceed with that. Thank you. So, can I ask a question? Did I miss one? Were we going to talk about the calendar for the budget? Oh, was that one of the We items? have talked about it. I think it was just in there for, as a, a reference. Just in there for point. fun. No, we didn't talk about the calendar today. No. no, we didn't talk about it today, but we've seen it before. Yeah, it was in there. It, it was. was. I saw it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, see it the uh, there wasn't a specific agenda. I think it was probably it. mixed in with budget report and financial report. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I think the intent really was just to let you see that calendar. Okay. Um, maybe it allows you to know that we've already met with Ashok, Evan, the Tim. three SMLs who are K to 12, Tim Person, Jenny. Okay. My only question on it, I, I it was great to see the whole calendar, but I didn't know if there was a way to identify where the, um, was it the budget advisory committee that we sort of sanctioned sort of last meeting? Are there so, checkpoint so meetings or anything we, along the way? Just for clarification, we did not sanction that last meeting. It that was already existed. existed. Sorry. Yes, uh, it and, and it is, like, those are the meetings. I'd have to, to pull it up now to look at the actual thing, but there are meetings. And there are monthly meetings of that group. As a matter of fact, we're meeting, uh, I think, I feel, is it next week or the week after? 
I just didn't see a lot. I, I, we had talked a lot at the here and at the Board of Supervisors meeting about um, collaborative work, and I know it's going on. Yes. But I didn't see any time that we get back together as a collaborative group until like you know January or whatever it was later. As a, you mean as a larger group with all of them? It, right. I just I was kind of wondering in my little isolation yep. chamber here if there were meetings going on so, i didn't really know and i haven't seen i haven't looked enough to find whether they're posted i'm sure they are but no uh they are not actually because they are not um subject to open meeting law it's a working they, group it's a working group but so they we have not met as an official group yet we are meeting this month i could comb through my calendar but we met uh just carol and i and norman and claire wright have met twice but not we have not met as the budget group with the finance director do they i don't know if the town still does not have one to my knowledge so that there there should be two eventually finance directors and one susan obviously and then the towns I and think then appropriations uh, the appropriations so that is the next meeting is where we will all and i will report back okay on that after we do meet thank you one, one question i have is the december 20th and right after january 3rd you know, this, these things take time, and it's like right after the holidays. Is there any way to consider it, pushing it did get January moved. 3rd? It did get moved, actually. That's the, um, oh, no, it was the public hearing got moved to the 10th. So is this the updated calendar we voted to accept at this board? I don't, I don't believe we actually can really change it because we voted on it at the Board of Selectmen me meeting. Well, I think January 3rd is a Thursday, so that must be a school committee night for us. Okay. I think that's why that date was chosen. So, but I think to go back to your concern, we moved the public hearing on that recommendation and the discussion of it to January 10th. Does that feel? No. So, is the January third meeting happening? Yes, that's a regular. Okay. Is that is that our regular meeting? The, the, everything that. Right? Yes, January third is regular. Is January tenth is special. Okay. So it's part of our regular and, meeting. And and the other thing that's important to note is that somebody from the Board of Appropriations and the Board of Selectmen will come to these presentations. Last year, I think they were both there for every single one of our budget presentations. Their liaison. And I, did they say, and I, we were all there, if it was going to be Claire and Brian, I feel like it was going to be both of them. Oh, I don't know. It's, it's either one or both for the Board of Selectmen and then somebody from Appropriations. Oh, I think they did say Claire and Brian. Yep. That's, yeah. Okay. So are we okay to go Sorry. to items by consensus? Okay, as the superintendent, I recommend that the school committee approve all of the following items um, by consensus as outlined in your agenda. Is there a motion for to? I move to approve okay. the second. items. Meg's, uh, motion by Meg, is there a second? Second. <laughs> it's second, thank you, by Jen. And all those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay, and then I that this time I would seek a motion to adjourn. Hallelujah. <laughs> I, I do. I move. I will. Okay, and is there a second? I do. I'll second that one too. Second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. And it, that we are so adjourned at uh, 10 20 p.m. And our next meeting is Thursday, November 1st, here in the uh, high school at 7 p.m. It is a regular meeting. Thank you all for. Uh, tuning in and I will see you on the first.